morning, everyone. Um, I will call this regular work session meeting of the Burnsville City Council to order. Uh, we are very informal at our work session, so we'll go around and, in, and everyone introduce themselves around the table. And then we'll also go on to the uh, audience area, so if you can just give us your name and address and which item you're here to uh, uh, address, and uh, that would be great. Elizabeth Couts, I'm the mayor of Burnsville. Kara Schultz, city council. Heather Johnston, uh, city manager. Uh, Aaron Tag, MnDOT, West Area Engineer. Ryan Peterson, Public Works Director. Dan Gustafson, City Council. Michelle Collins, City Clerk. John Gessner, Sun This Week. Dave Giles, I live on El Lane. Uh, okay. Mark Savard, Loop Road. Dale Ronning, Loop Road. Okay. Did you leave Circle High Drive? Yeah, you leave Circle High Drive, Little mm -hmm. Streets. Okay. And we'll go to the back row. Sandy Duquesne, Marsha Ann Lane. Uh, Wayne Duquesne, Marsha Ann. Okay. Debbie Emerson, Circle I Drive. Carol Meyer, Loop Road. Okay. Nancy Frazier, Marsha Ann. Okay. Lance Freed, Oreo Court. Thank you. Bob Workman, Circle I Drive, Streets. Mm -hmm. Larry Chorkman, Circle I Drive. Gary Schneller, 152nd Street, um, for the planning, Third City. Street planning, I guess. Okay. Carl Lawrence, out in <coughs> lane for item number two. Okay. I'm Jen Lehman with Minnesota Valley Transit Authority for item number one. And Richard Crawford with the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Very Steve good. Schwartz, Oriel Court. Lisa Emerson, Circle High Drive. Gary Emerson, 1217 Circle High Drive, <coughs> item number three. Okay. Jeff Roddick, Public Works. Ian Pulitzer, Street Superintendent. Okay. John Schmeling, Assistant City Engineer. Okay. Welcome, everyone. So, because we have uh, all of our residents from uh, Southwest Burnsville, we're going to switch the agenda items up. Well, instead of uh, that item being number three, we're going to make your item number two. So we'll address that issue uh, up front. But we have to make sure that we get MnDOT uh, on the first uh, ag agenda item. So uh, the first item then will be uh, item number one, the I-35W uh, from downtown Minneapolis uh, and the construction update. And uh, Ryan Peterson, our public works director, are you going to tee it up and introduce <coughs> the uh, folks from MnDOT? Sounds good. OK, thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Um, you may have noticed as you drive into downtown these days on 35W, there's more cranes per square foot than you've ever imagined. And that's because this exciting project has started up. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the situation is going to get more challenging for all the commuters and people who try to get into downtown. So we're lucky enough to have Aaron Tag with uh, MnDOT, the project manager here. He's going to go over uh, what the project is all about. And then we have uh, Jen Lehman and Richard Crawford from MVTA who are going to discuss transit and transit um, advantages associated with the project when some of these more uh, serious traffic impacts start up. So with that, I turn it over to Aaron. Aaron, right. welcome. Yeah, thank you uh, for having me. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, as Ryan said, talk about this exciting project that's going to have some impacts this summer. And the more opportunities we get to get out and tell people about these impacts so they can prepare for them, um, the better. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having us come out and be able to t talk to you about it. Um, so the 35W at 94 downtown to Crosstown project uh, runs south of downtown Minneapolis, uh, essentially from 94 down to 43rd Street. Uh, th this project is a project that's been in the making for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the four uh, agencies that uh, kind of are in partnership for this project. So they all have um, uh, money in this project and have played a big part in the development of the project. Hennepin County deserves a lot of credit for leading this project up until the last couple of years uh, when MnDOT took it over for the final design and construction. Um, I always like to start off and kind of talk about what our end goal is, and uh, there's a lot of great project benefits uh, uh, from this project. So um, first one is replacing aging infrastructure. So this section of 35W was built over 50 years ago. Uh, it's, you know, getting to the point where it's uh, met the end of its useful life. Uh, the pavement needs to be replaced, so we're replacing all the pavement along this corridor. Uh, there's also a number of bridges uh, that need to be replaced or redecked. So uh, we have 15 bridges that are being either replaced or redecked. Uh, we have all the pavement being replaced. Uh, we have a number of noise walls and retaining walls that are being uh, repaired or replaced. Um, 
this project also improves access. So Lake Street, um, to some extent, was left out of uh, access to 35W when 35W was originally uh, built through South, uh, South Minneapolis um, in, the, in the 60s. Um, so we're adding a new access to uh, Lake Street from southbound 35W. Uh, and then in the northbound direction, there's currently a exit to uh, 31st and Lake Street. Um, north of there, um, kind of into the east, so uh, kind of north of 28th Street up to, say, 24th Street, um, and over near Park in Portland, there's a lot of very large employers. So you have Alina, Abbott Hospital, Children's Hospital, uh, Wells Fargo. Um, Alina alone on their campus, they also own Abbott, but... Uh, they have 10,000 employees um, on their campus, not to mention all the patients they have every day. So we're adding a new access to, uh, to 28th Street, um, and that will help uh, get traffic to those very large employers uh, without having to exit at 31st and Lake Street and kind of wind their way through uh, some of the neighborhoods over there uh, to get to those employers. Um, there's also a lot of uh, transit um, components to this project. So. This project has pieces of the orange line in it, um, which is a project that is going to come down and uh, serve Burnsville in the future. Um, so one, one element of that is the new Lake Street Transit Station. So if you go out there today, uh, the top picture there is the existing uh, bus stop uh, for Lake Street. So there's some uh, long, uh, tall stairs, uh, not ADA accessible, that you have to climb up uh, and wait for the bus on the side of the freeway there in a small, unheated shelter. Um, that is going to be replaced with a new transit <laughs> station in the center of 35W. Um, buses will be using the new 35W uh, MinPass lanes to get into downtown Minneapolis. So uh, they will be able to, with the, uh, with the station in the center, they'll be able to just pull over, uh, stop the new transit station that will be um, much nicer, ADA accessible, um, much better uh, shelters. Um, to catch the buses. Um, all the buses that are going to go into downtown Minneapolis are going to stop at this station. So that means in the peak uh, hour, um, that's about 100 buses an hour. So if you go to the station um, in the peak hour, you're on average going to wait less than a minute for a bus. Um, there's also going to be a new uh, 12th Street uh, connection um, from uh, Highway 65, which is that direct... Highway 65 is a direct connection from 35W into downtown Minneapolis. So off of Highway 65, there's going to be a new direction over, uh, connection over 12th Street for transit buses only, uh, in and out of downtown. Um, that's going to speed up their trip over to Marquette and 2nd, uh, where most of the buses that use this corridor uh, do their drop-offs and picks up, pickups um, in downtown Minneapolis. Um, so that'll improve speed quite a bit. From the Lake Street Station, uh, it'll be a seven-minute ride uh, from from there into the heart of downtown Minneapolis, which is a pretty quick ride. Uh, and then we also have some mobility improvements. So I mentioned before the MinPass lanes that are going to be added. Currently northbound, there's a MinPass shoulder that you can use uh, in the peak hour. That's going to become an actual MinPass lane. And then the southbound direction, uh, currently we don't have MinPass lanes. There will be a MinPass lane added in the southbound direction. Uh, and then a couple of key uh, kind of changes to how the interchange with 94 works. Um, currently, if you're headed northbound on 35W, you want to go westbound on 94. There's the kind of flyover ramp that becomes the exit for Hennepin Lindale. Um, there's a lot of weaving that goes on as cars try to get onto 94 and cars are trying to get off to Hen Hennepin Lindale exit. That ramp, when it's uh, reconstructed, will come in on the left side of 94. Um, where 78% of the cars that use that ramp continue on 94 past 394, so they want to be on the left side of 94 anyways, and it will have its own lane through the tunnel. So that traffic won't have to merge into the 94 traffic. They'll, they'll have their own lane. Um, so that should help uh, both the 94 traffic as well as the 35W traffic. And then on 35W southbound, um, currently traffic coming from westbound 94 has to merge onto the 35W uh, lanes, um, in, in the future, there will be an auxiliary lane, so an additional lane from where that entrance comes in all the way to the new exit at Lake Street. Uh, so that will give traffic a lot longer to um, do their, their merging and um, stuff. Um, and then lastly, uh, but not least, um, pet and bike improvements. Uh, so kind of anywhere where we're touching local streets, we're making ADA improvements, uh, making 
uh, the streets more pedestrian accessible. Um, the Greenway is just north of Lake Street. Currently, there's no connection at 35W from the Greenway down to Lake Street. Uh, there's going to be a new uh, pedestrian connection um, there, which will be really important, especially with the new uh, Lake Street Transit Station. Uh, so now I get to talk about traffic impacts, which um, aren't, aren't as great as the benefits. Um, in the packet you got, um, there's a uh, schedule um, that is on our website, so mindotgov slash 35W94. Uh, that's our project website. Um, so that schedule's on there. As the schedule changes, we update it. So, um, you know, as you're sending out correspondence to people, um, if you're talking about the project, you know, feel free to include a link to that schedule because that will be updated and they'll always have the newest uh, information uh, on there. Uh, the project has five stages. We're currently in the first stage. We move in uh, to the second stage uh, this summer, um, and I'll talk, I'll talk about um, <coughs> stage, stage two um, today, which um, once we move into stage two, the, the traffic impacts are pretty great, and uh, they lessen up over time, but they, uh, they, they stay high throughout the project, which goes through 2021. Um, so we're currently in stage one. Um, most of the work right now is happening at the Franklin Avenue Bridge, which Ryan noted there's um, probably nearly a dozen cranes over there working at Franklin right now. Uh, we're also working on the 38th Street Bridge, uh, which was uh, demolished uh, in early March. Um, starting uh, next week, uh, the 11th Street ramp uh, from eastbound 94 will close into downtown Minneapolis, uh, and that'll stay closed. Um, until we move into stage two of the project. Um, so then uh, this summer, early summer, sometime in the June timeframe, we're gonna move into the stage two of the project and that's um, when uh, the impacts get considerably greater. Uh, northbound 35W, uh, it's currently four general purpose lanes and that one <coughs> min pass shoulder lane, that's gonna be reduced down to two general purpose lanes and one min pass lane. In the southbound direction, it's currently four general purpose lanes. That's going to be reduced down to two general purpose lanes. Um, that connection, Highway 65 into downtown Minneapolis with Stage 2, that's going to completely close. Um, so traffic heading into downtown Minneapolis um, will need to find other ways to get into it. Um, the official detour route will be uh, to go over to uh, the 3rd Street exit, um, which is past the sharp curve. Um, uh, we also suggest, you know, people considering com co going into uh, downtown Minneapolis from 394. Um, the ramp uh, from northbound 35W to westbound 94 um, also closes uh, with stage two, and that ramp is going to mm -hmm. stay closed uh, through 2021. So that's a three and a half year closure of a pretty major interstate to interstate ramp. Uh, and then in the southbound direction, the, the ramp from eastbound 94 to southbound 35W is also going to close uh, for that same time period. Um, what I, I should have mentioned with the Highway 65 closure is stage two is going to last 120 days. Um, when stage two is over and we move into stage three, one lane um, on Highway 65 into downtown Minneapolis will reopen, um, and one transit only lane out of downtown Minneapolis. Uh, will reopen and it's going to stay that way until the the end of the project um, so planning for construction impacts um, you know we've been we've been going out and meeting with as many people as we can uh, we've been doing a lot of events uh, in downtown Minneapolis trying to talk with employers there um, we are really encouraging people to consider using uh, transit um, during uh, during the whole project, especially during stage two, um, MVTA can you know they'll, they'll be after me and they can talk more about kind of what they're doing. Um, but there will be you know we're trying to do a number of things to to keep that transit advantage into downtown Minneapolis because we know we're losing a lot of uh, vehicle capacity and we need to uh, see if we can move people into downtown Minneapolis other ways. Also consider um, you know using uh, bicycling and walking. Um, E-Workplace uh, is an outfit that helps employers uh, set up telecommuting policies 
Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, telecommute from home every day. And it might mean that maybe you can telecommute for a couple hours in the morning um, and come in a little later, which kind of helps spread out, uh, the, you know, the traffic demands on 35W. Um, and we're, we've also been working very closely with Move Minneapolis, which is the downtown uh, transportation management organization uh, for Minneapolis. Um, and they're, they're working with us with a lot of the downtown employers uh, to get the word out. Um, we're also trying to set up um, a contract with uh, the 494 uh, TMO um, to, to get the word out. Um, and then consider, you know, different uh, ways of getting into downtown Minneapolis. So, you know, I mentioned 394. Uh, we are doing a project this spring on westbound 394 uh, to add an additional, um, to stripe an additional temporary lane uh, from downtown Minneapolis out to Highway 100 to provide some additional capacity out of uh, downtown. And we're also restriping 62 westbound between Valley View Road in Highway 100 to provide a little bit of extra capacity there where we can. Um, Will people be able to go uh, from 100 then to 62 and take 35 south? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that, that'll be kind of a really important, you know, especially for Burnsville residents who have the kind of opportunity yeah. to um, choose how they're getting into the city, um, you, know, it, you know, looking at, you know, possibly using 100 um, as, you know, as your access into downtown Minneapolis um, might be a really good idea. If they're taking 77 north yes. and go over on 62 and go up 35, can they have access onto 35? Uh, yes, so if you take 77, 62, 62. Uh, west, and then you will still be able to go 35W northbound. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> um, and uh, the I just found out in the last couple of days... Um, that the downtown ABC ramp, so those are the large ramps built over 394, uh, kind of on the north side of downtown near the Twin Stadium. Um, uh, they were built as part of the 394 project, and they're focused on a big piece of, uh, you know, why they were built was to get carpoolers uh, to go there. And they've long had a, a special rate for carpoolers who use the 394 corridor. Uh, for this project, they're expanding uh, the zone that you can live in uh, to get that special rate, carpool rate, um, to include most of the southwest metro area. Um, so, so carpooling and being able to use those min pass lanes, again, is a, another good alternative. Okay. Um, you also, I think, got a magnet uh, in your packet. Um, if you ever want any more magnets that you can hand out to people, let us know. We can um, give them to you to help get the word out. Uh, we, the project does have a hotline. Um, so people can feel free to call or email or uh, visit the web page to, um, you know, ask questions, file complaints, um, whatever. So, Do you have enough to give out to all of our residents? I don't have enough today. Um, okay. So I, I got the last box, uh, which was a partial box, out of the office today. Okay. But um, I, I can get more for... Uh, Target-rich area. There's a lot of people <laughs> yeah. here. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Any questions for uh, for Aaron? Yes, please. I got a question for you. I know some. My wife works down at Wells Fargo, and my son-in-law works at Children's. Why don't they make it more convenient to get from a freeway to one of those to the number of the employers down there? Now you got to walk a number of blocks through not so great neighborhoods, and if you're in the middle of the night. I don't think a woman would want to be walking in the middle of the night through some of these neighborhoods. So why don't they make it more convenient to get from the freeway to these employers? From from a from the thirty from a bus standpoint. So yep. if you were to take the bus, um, that's why she doesn't take it now. Right. I mean, so from so, I guess from a MinDOT perspective, that's you know a little bit out of you know my purview. So that's you know getting yep. into the the city of Minneapolis. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, especially with the creation of this Lake Street transit station, um, you know, that hopefully that will help activate yeah. the whole area and, you know, kind of uh, help with some of those issues. I'll get Lucy. Yeah. And we don't have anyone from uh, Metro Transit here, but we do have our partner, Luther, is here from MBTA. And uh, 
Ryan, is Luther next? Uh, yep, um, MBTA is next, absolutely. Jen, Jen I think, is going to do the, their planning director is going to do the okay. primary. That'll process. give us some information on all of that. Yes, please. What is the uh, impact going to start on the uh, river bridge south? <laughs> right, so the river yeah. bridge, it's not uh, not my right. project, but um, they are going to start work this summer, but my understanding is that the, the major work, uh, the impacts that you'll, you'll really notice aren't going to start until next year. Next year. So we have some information on the river bridge because uh, the folks who are managing that project was here, and I think we have some information on our website, or else we have the meeting mm -hmm. when they were here on yeah. the website. If so, if you can pull that up and put it out there, and then you can hear that presentation on the bridge because they were here. Yeah, Aaron's yeah. response is absolutely correct. Be, yeah. Major impacts on the bridge will be early 2019. Yeah. yeah. But there's still a lot of impacts in, uh, trans in traveling from Burnsville and south of the river into Minneapolis. So understanding all of those impacts is beneficial for all of us in uh, making sure how we're going to uh, move ourselves from one destination to the other. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Good okay. Good. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> and uh, Please, and then give your name and uh, again for everyone to know. And uh, hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Jen Lehman, planning manager with MVTA, and we also have Richard Crawford, our public information manager, and Luther Winder, our executive director, is in the audience as well. Um, and we're here to speak more specifically about some of the transit impacts of the project that Aaron was just speaking of, and maybe just briefly to respond to the question about um, access and, and safety and things like that in, in downtown Minneapolis. Um, from a transit perspective, I think the common theme that you'll hear across everything today is collaboration. And so the biggest thing for MVTA in situations like what was described is to help make us aware. Um, we do record every rider request and every comment that um, is provided to MVTA either by phone or email um, and we do our best to carry those forward and so in that type of situation we would be working with Metro Transit in the city of Minneapolis in order to find some improvements so we would just need to know more specifics about the situation. Um, and then getting into the information that we have prepared for tonight, um, we passed around a couple of handouts. One of them are the slides that we'll go through tonight. One of them is the 35W flyer that our outreach team has prepared for this project. And then the third piece is MVTA's recently approved strategic plan, which Council Member Keeley was active in um, helping us update and will take us through 2022. So it's not directly related to this project, but um, just something that we recently accomplished and really appreciate Burnsville's assistance in helping us move that forward. I'm going to ask you to speak up a little bit more sure. so everybody can hear you, Jan. Absolutely. Please. Thank so you. if you can use a little bit more outside voice. Yes. And if you can't hear me at some point, just raise your hand, please. Yeah. Um, as you heard from Aaron, the greatest transit impacts will be starting this summer. And so what MBTA is going to be focusing on is ex maintaining our existing service and expanding our service to a limited extent. And what we'll be running through today is how um, that service will be rolled out and how riders and residents can stay plugged in and get more information. So. This is always the tricky part, right? There we go. Uh, so just to start out with, for those of you who are less familiar with the MVTA service area, we do have seven member cities south of the Minnesota River. There's some quick facts up here on this slide, and for the purposes of today's conversation, I wanted to hit on the last bullet that we do operate 340 daily trips to and from Minneapolis. That's about a third of the total number of trips that we operate each weekday, but it carries over two thirds of our ridership. So our Minneapolis service is critical to, to what we do. And then to kind of put that in context a little bit, um, the project map that Aaron had on his slide, kind of that 43rd Street to downtown is at the very top of this slide, just south of downtown. That's the project area. And then on the rest of the slide, you have the MVTA service area. So we do stretch from Shakopee in the west. Um, our service area is what's shaded in the orange <coughs> to Rosemont on the east. And then our primary corridors to get in and out of Minneapolis are the 169 corridor, the 35 um, corridor 
corridor. And then we have St. Paul service that uses 35E and 35W as well. Um, and you have some quick facts about what our, our route breakdown is. Um, as far as the Minneapolis routes go, we have 12 routes that serve Minneapolis. Those are all express routes. And um, those use the 35W corridor. So those will all be impacted by the upcoming project. And the way that MVTA has kind of um, gone about prioritizing what to do with service is identi identified on this slide here. Um, our first priority is really to maintain existing service. And in doing that, we know how important it is for riders to know um, their regular schedule and to have you know, minor changes to what they, what they are riding every day. So we made a choice to maintain the existing trip time as much as possible. Um, and so riders will be able to continue to take their 4.05 p.m. trip out of, south, out of Minneapolis and head southbound. We have not adjusted that, so I think that's a great benefit to riders. Where we are making some adjustments is how we approach our detour routes. We are using a variety of corridors, so we will have some transit advantages that allow us to continue to use 35W while it's closed to general purpose traffic. But we'll also be looking at the Hiawatha corridor, um, potentially coming in 35E and around 94, and vice versa coming in 394 from the west. Additionally, we're adding vehicles by extending the retirement. Our vehicles have a regular replacement schedule, but to give us some additional capacity, we're operating those past their useful life um, and kind of maintaining them longer than their planned duration to help us provide more capacity and more recovery during this project time. And then the last couple of items here, we'll get into more detail on the following slides, um, is really about how are we engaging the riders and, and putting the information out to the community. And then um, exactly what are we adding to service? So the thing that people will see coming up with our, our next service change, which begins in May, is added recovery time. So that means that buses will have more time between when they end a trip and the next trip begins, so that if there are any delays due to construction zones or traffic and things like that, it won't impact the following trip. Um, and that's something that we do to maintain reliability within our service. And then for these last two, I'll move on to the next two slides. Um, we have, um, through working with MnDOT and Met Council and Metro Transit, we have the ability to add some new service specifically for this project. One of the ways that we'll be adding service is to extend some of our select trips between Burnsville Transit Station, which is just north of where we are here tonight at City Hall, um, on the northeast corner of Highway 13 and Nicolette, and we'll be extending some of our express Route 460 trips so that they also offer an opportunity for people to park at heart of the city and catch the 460 there. Um, what this does is it allows us to use the parking availability at heart of the city. Um, these trips will still serve both sites, and um, it takes advantage of trips that have some existing capacity so that we can make sure our buses are as full as they can be when they're running through the corridor. And this just goes down to Minneapolis. It's not the split where it goes over to St. Paul. Correct. Yep. So this trip would go direct um, mm -hmm. on those that are extended. There's about 10 to 15 morning trips that will be extended and 10 to 15 in the afternoon. They'll go direct from heart of the city to Burnsville Transit Station and then on to Minneapolis. Okay. Yep. And this service will start Jan or, uh, not January, July 2nd. Okay. And then the second service that we're adding is some direct service between Egan Transit Station and the 46th Street Light Rail. Um, this one is a little bit of a different concept for commuters who are used to getting on and going down the 35W corridor. But what it does is it introduces more reliability because we don't have to deal with the changing staging of construction and the potential construction delays. It also allows people who are traveling from the South Metro to make a decision at the split where maybe they take 35E, park at Egan Transit Station, and then they'll have a direct service from Egan Transit Station. Um, let me see if I can find the cursor again. Egan Transit Station, which is just off of 35E to the 46th Street Light Rail Station, <coughs> and you can connect directly to the Blue Line Light Rail, or you can connect to the A-Line and get into St. Paul. Um, and these will be timed connections, so the, the movements will be fairly easy to commuters. The biggest change is that you'll be going to a different corridor to end up in Minneapolis. Um, and that's something that we'll be rolling out the promotions for in the next couple of months here. And again, this service will start on 
July 2nd. Okay. Uh, when you, you mentioned ben. using the heart of the city station, do you yep. have a projection on how many more riders you'll get by using that particular station? Um, we don't have a lot of forecasted projections on what we expect the ridership to be. We can talk more about capacity of the buses and what we're able to take on. Um, I think, like Aaron was saying, we're trying to promote transit in general, and there's not been a lot of forecasting. This is a project that's pretty unique. Um, I don't know if there's other places across the country that have such a high-volume highway corridor that's been completely closed um, yeah. that we can even draw from examples. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Just yeah. to take team on that and, and what Aaron was saying, the capacity on 35W is going to change dramatically in mm -hmm. June. So anybody who uses that corridor, it's going to be really, I like the fact that, that MnDOT is encouraging alternate modes of travel or the e-work mm -hmm. or using transit. This is a great time to use transit as well to try to alleviate that congestion because it, starting in June, kind of everything is going to change. So we'll be really ramping up the messaging on our new routes, both in uh, Burnsville and Egan, to get the word out. So uh, for people interested in using transit as uh, one of those alternate modes. Yeah, and people will know that both Burnsville and Egan will have the capacity so that they can park and take the bus across the river and then take light rail or else take the bus across the river and then uh, continue on to Minneapolis on the red line, correct? On the light rail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Does the bus also go from Egan all the way up to, to Minneapolis. Minneapolis? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. what I meant because I know that they can take both light rail and they can take bus right yep. now, but they can continue to do that correct. with the added capacity over in Egan. So. Correct. Yep, and Richard, we'll get into this too, um, but Richard has been uh, starting to put out uh, up the different route options to the MBTA website, and we offer trip planning assistance and things like that. So if there's ever any question, we just encourage people to contact us. And, Ryan, there will be a link from uh, that. So if people are uh, accessing our website, Heather, that they, they, can, they can get on that link and see it also. So there's a link that connects both. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll start that up. June-ish or May. You know, I think that we will start yeah. it up when it's time. We want to make sure that going. people have as much access to the information. And so any vehicle we can use to get that information out to people, the better it is. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Then the last two slides that I have, um, the first one talks more specifically about the transit advantages that we have secured as part of this project. Um, it has been a huge collaboration between MnDOT, MVTA, Metro Transit, Met Council, and we're very happy that we do have some transit advantages that allow us to continue on the 35W corridor, so we'll be using some local streets in locations where general traffic um, would not necessarily have access. Um, so that's what this slide identifies as some of the things that are specific to transit. So we'll have queue jumps where buses can bypass general purpose traffic at s select intersections. And then um, one of the other main advantages that we'll have is transit only and emergency vehicle only access on the 31st Street exit to and from 30, 35W. Um, and so that will allow us to, um, to have a little bit more reliability in the corridor. Overall, with all of these transit advantages, enforcement is going to be critical, and we've been working with MnDOT on that. Um, and I think the other important point for Burnsville staff and council members and residents is um, the concurrent 35W and Minnesota River Bridge project that was brought up. We do have transit advantages maintained throughout that project as well, so getting us out of the South Metro here and north of the river should not be an issue, um, and we just really appreciate that. Um, that access being maintained. Right. And then the final slide that we have is some of the outreach promotions that we're working on. So, of course, we encourage people to take the bus, um, you know, give it a try, let us know what you think, let us know where we can make adjustments. Um, what you see starting July 2nd, we will continue to refine throughout the fall as well. So we are, we, we are really interested in feedback. Um, you know, begin planning your alternatives early. MnDOT has been encouraging people to think about this. Um, it, it seems like July and June are still pretty far away, but they'll be here before you know it. So yeah. start thinking about what some of your options might be. Um, you know, consider adjusting working hours a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Um, our express services are set up to accommodate that. Even, you know, working remotely one day a week or considering carpooling and just kind of the, the mix of how all of those solutions come together can really, you know, benefit everyone um, while this construction is ongoing. How late 
what is the last ride from Minneapolis to Burnsville? Um, that is a good question. I do not have that with me, but we have uh, service on our Route 465 <coughs> that goes from the University of Minnesota through downtown, and that definitely goes until like 9 and 10 o'clock at night. So we can get specifics for you about yeah. last trip of the day. Yeah, especially when we're asking people to make adjustments to their work yep. schedule. Right. Because if they're going to be exiting work at 10, 10, 10, 10 30, then there should be um, the opportunity to take a bus to come south, Absolutely. to come home. And then the other points I just wanted to mention are, you know, consider a lot of residents right now do have a direct one-seat ride where they go from Burnsville Transit Station to Minneapolis. Do consider those transfers at Mall of America or to the Blue Line. Sometimes those can be faster or more reliable. Um, sign up for our route alerts on our MVTA website. Um, contact customer service at MVTA if you have questions about trip planning or what options are available to you. And then Minda also has their alert page set up. Um, and so there's just a couple of different ways that people can stay plugged in mm -hmm. and so we just really appreciate the opportunity you're the first that we've really spoken to about some of our outreach efforts and our, our service plans and just appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and share with and you let's all. make sure we always all connect between all of our websites whether it's ours or else in Egan mm -hmm. and uh, Savage so that people know what are the routes and how to access okay and uh, Marty Dahl has been great about that so I'll uh, connect with him and make sure we're all on the same page there. Okay. Did you have anything else to add, Richard? Uh, no, I don't. Anybody else? <coughs> Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Let's make sure that we communicate, communicate, communicate. From where I sit, the more information we put out there, mm -hmm. the better the information, the better the decisions our residents can make about their movement through the south to the north. Okay. Absolutely. We will work with your staff. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else, Aaron? No, nope. I don't have anything else. Okay. Ryan? Oh, we're good. We're good. Thank you so much, yeah. everyone. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for Luther, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, our next one, we're moving first uh, instead of... Uh, the sidewalk uh, plowing issue. We're going to move to Southwest Burnsville deteriorating street pavement conditions. Okay, and um, John, you're going to be teeing this up. Ryan, are you going to make any uh, introductory remarks? Let's see if we can, uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. okay, good evening. I'm John Schmaling, the Assistant City Engineer for Burnsville, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Southwest Burnsville deteriorating street pavement condition on a lot of the neighborhood streets. Uh, to start, I'll give a brief overview of the Southwest Burnsville policy, uh, then I'll walk through a timeline of what's happened to bring us to this meeting today. Um, I'll walk you through briefly the current conditions of some of the streets uh, as, uh, and then walk through some strategies that staff have looked at to address the deteriorating pavement and then uh, talk a little bit about budget impact of the different options, uh, give a staff recommendation and then provide time for discussion. Now before we even get to the discussion, uh, we will I know all of these people here want to speak. Mm -hmm. So we want to hear from them before we discuss. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Can I just okay. ask a basic question? Sure. Is a rainwater meeting here tonight? Is this where that's going no, to No, that's not going to take okay. place here. Uh, Heather, where is the rain garden oh, meeting? Is Diamond, I don't know. Head. Diamond Head? Diamond Head? The... Yeah, it, because of all of the... <laughs> Oh, no, it's okay. I'm glad that you asked the question. And you know, we're very informal in our work sessions. So it doesn't make sense for you to sit through when you're at the wrong meeting. And because we're doing a lot of construction here, we're sharing all of our facilities. So, well, good luck. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for doing rain gardens. Thank you. Okay, John. Okay, uh, to start out, uh, the Southwest Burnsville policy that we currently have states uh, it addresses sewer extensions, water extensions, 
developments and street improvements. Currently, per that policy, to uh, get any street improvements, there needs to be a petition from the residents, and they would need to pay for 100% of those improvements. Um, what I'm here to talk to you tonight about is the uh, deteriorating streets. I'm not here to discuss extending utilities or anything of that nature. Um, that's not what I'm here to discuss. Um, then uh, timeline. Did we hear any complaints from the residents about their deteriorating streets? Or is that just our observation? It's our observation. Right. Yeah, so, um, well, it, John's timeline here, we'll get into some of that, but we uh, attempted to address this because we have received lots of complaints about the street quality out there. Okay, so we did receive complaints because I've been here and we said we won't do anything on their streets unless they complain about it and then they need to know the process. We have received and we continue to receive. Okay, okay, yep. I just wanted to make sure. Heather. Madam Mayor, there are some new, newer residents, I think, yep. down there in Southwest Burnsville, and I think that has also, those folks have, have wanted a better understanding mm -hmm. of what the policies are down there and, and kind of wondered why we weren't doing much on their streets. So. Well, and that's good. So when we have new residents and they want to understand, then it's a good time for to clarify and to have them understand what why why that whole area is treated differently. Absolutely. Okay, good. Yep. Very good. So it's because uh, the residents want it that way. <laughs> okay, so I'll get walk you through a timeline here. So many years ago, most of these streets were built as gravel roads. Mm -hmm. About 20 years ago, plus or minus, uh, residents petitioned to have the streets paved. So at that time, we put a layer of blacktop on the gravel streets. Um, in 2016, uh, where complaints were mounting and staff was observing that a lot of these streets were needing uh, a lot of annual patching, uh, not just once in a while, but year after year. Uh, so uh, staff uh, then in late 2016 did some geotechnical investigation, had some soil borings done uh, to collect more information. Uh, then at the 2017 all-day work session, uh, council directed staff to hold an open house uh, with the Southwest Burnsville residents. In June of 2017, an open house was held with residents, and the uh, deteriorating street pavement was discussed some at that open house. Uh, the majority of the feedback at that open house was that people wanted to see something done to their streets uh, to, to address the deteriorating street pavement. So then, uh, that brings us to the August work session in 2017. Uh, this uh, issue was briefly discussed at a work session. And at that time, uh, council directed staff to come up with <coughs> proposed changes to the Southwest Burnsville policy, as well as reach out to the residents and also look into uh, what the costs of some options would be. Uh, in over this last winter, uh, we did some analysis with uh, coming up with some of those costs and options to bring to the residents into this work session. In late March, uh, I sent out a letter to the Southwest Burnsville residents that live on streets that we would currently consider poor uh, condition. And then that brings us to today where I'm discussing with you guys um, <coughs> how you want to proceed or what direction you want to give staff on how to do uh, how to address these deteriorating streets. So next I'll look at uh, current conditions. So there's about four and three quarter or about four and a half miles of paved streets in southwest Burnsville that are neighborhood streets. Uh, about four and a quarter miles of those streets are currently in poor condition. And there's also about three quarters of a mile of uh, unpaved streets, so gravel streets. So here I've got uh, some pictures of some of the poor condition roads. Um, this is uh, Circle High Drive. It's a little hard to see, but you can see there's different layers of patching, um, deteriorating street. <coughs> this is uh, King's Court. 
this actually is kind of falling apart, as you can see. Uh, here another one, Oreo cord, another good example. And this would be Valley View Road, and this is a perfect, another good example of a couple different patches, streets falling apart. That's an older patch, a newer patch. So you can see we're having to come back to these uh, regularly. Then Loop Road. Uh, this is, might be easier for you to see, but there's again a set of patching. This was taken a few weeks ago. Um, there's even some of the road that's even peeling off um, again this this spring. And David's Court. Uh, this has a little bit of like uh, skim patching on it, but it's still not in real good condition. Um, and then Loop Road. And another one on Loop Road. So, as I said, over the winter, staff <laughs> looked at some different strategies to address the deteriorating streets. Um, and I will present to you here some of the options that we're looking at. One option would be to do nothing with any of the streets, just continue to patch them. Uh, if we were to go that route, uh, staff would continue to do pa annual patching until such time as it would be infeasible. At that time, we'd consider grinding the streets up and returning them to a gravel state uh, once we kind of reach the tipping point on costs. Next strategy option would be a uh, thin overlay. Thin overlay option would, would be basically uh, we'd go in, do a, some minimal patching of really bad areas, then place an inch and a half overlay over the, all of the deteriorated streets. Uh, this would probably buy them another five to ten years of life. Um, five more so in the worst areas and probably ten in the better the areas that are holding together a little better. Uh, and if we did this option, I'd propose that we do it with no assessments. We just use uh, city funds for that, and it'd be basically a, a temporary fix. Another option we're looking at is uh, overlay. <coughs> and if you look at this map here, I show the streets that staff believe are reasonable candidates for this. Uh, the overlay option would be more similar to what we would call a rehabilitation on an urban street. <coughs> With this, we would do significant patching of the bad areas, so maybe replace about 20% of the pavement that is bad first. Then we'd place a two inch overlay on top of that. This could be, uh, this would extend the life of the road approximately 10 to 15 years, so a good extension of life. Um, when I come to the budget section, uh, there's a couple different options on this. You could consider assessing at 100% of the residents or uh, follow the policy that we generally do with urban streets, which would be to assess 40% of the cost. But I'll talk about that in the budget section, but that's what the overlay strategy is for. Then reconstruction uh, slash reclamation. The streets shown on this map are ones that staff believe um, are too far gone for an overlay to be effective. Uh, and we'd recommend that they be reconstructed with three inches of blacktop over six inches of either new or reclaimed uh, gravel base. Uh, this strategy would have a life of about 20 years, and at that time, they would actually probably qualify for getting some resurfacing. So we would have the opportunity to extend their life some more by doing basically like a, either a thin or a regular overlay at that time. Uh, again, with this strategy, a couple funding options would be either assess at 100% or uh, assess 40% to the residents. Then lastly, um, just wanted to touch on there's the three quarters of a mile of unpaved streets that are out there. Uh, currently, uh, we're recommending that we just stick to regular policy. 
Uh, if these people would want, if the residents would want their street paved, they would need to uh, petition the city and pay for 100% of the cost for improvements consistent with uh, the rest of the neighborhood streets that have been paved. So now I will walk you through what the budget impact would be for some of these oh. options. So in the chart here, I've got uh, option 1A and option 1B. Uh, these two options are basically doing the uh, overlay and reconstruction slash reclamation improvements. And 1A would be if you assess 40% to the residents. 1B would be if you assess 100% to the residents. Uh, with option 1A, uh, one A or one B, the total cost would be about 1.43 million of improvements. One uh, A, we would be assessing about 600,000 plus or minus to the residents. Uh, if we were to do that, staff would propose that we do a per lot assessment methodology. So just charge an equal amount to each lot. And when I say per lot, uh, we would, tr we would uh, recommend that we treat the larger lots that are splittable as multiple lots. So charge those larger lots more than one lot, and then ones that are not splittable, charge one lot. Okay. Well, there's some size criteria, and also we look at uh, how much usable space there is on the land, like wetlands and stuff kind of offset that. Uh, Ryan could speak to it more if you... Yeah. So let me, yeah, it's two acres out there. So to, um, to manage our process, we'll let him finish what he has to do. And then when you're going to speak, can you also give us your name and address so we can have it for the record? So that we can answer all of the questions and everybody understands what we're going to be doing. Okay. So John. if we do option 1A uh, in the areas that I showed you in the strategies section and do 40% assessments on a per lot basis, it would end up uh, giving us about a $3,100 per lot uh, assessment for an overlay and about a $3,800 per lot assessment for reconstruction or reclamation. If we assessed, did option 1B and assess 100%, then the per lot assessments would be about 7,800 for overlay and about 9,500 uh, for reconstruction slash reclamation. Uh, option two would be to do the thin overlay with no assessments. Uh, if we were to choose that option, that would be about $800,000 with no assessments. If we choose the do nothing option and continue to patch, um, patching costs would continue to rise until we reached a point where we mm -hmm. felt it was cheaper to return the streets to gravel and just grade them. And let's make sure everybody understands when you talk about option two with a thin overlay and there's no assessments, that comes out of every property owner in Burnsville. Correct. Yeah. yeah it comes Let's out just of make sure that the, 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 when you talk about the funds that we're talking about, uh, it comes from every property in Burnsville. Correct. That's where the tax goes yep. into every. Yeah. So, uh, and one thing I wanted to mention too is if we go with option any of these options, uh, especially option one or one A or one B. Staff would recommend <coughs> would recommend uh, doing the improvements over a period of years. Uh, we wouldn't recommend doing all the improvements at once because we'd like to time some of the improvements to fit with the current conditions. So likely we'd probably want to tackle the overlay streets first to catch them, and then we'd probably phase out the reconstruct and reclamation just based on what we've observed. Yeah, and when you're talking, you're talking about uh, when you're talking about uh, option one and and for all of this, it's the four and a half mile of streets that are paved, right? It's for four and a quarter of that four and a half miles, because there's a quarter mile. Yeah, there's a quarter of mile. Streets that are pretty new that don't need anything done yeah. to them. Uh, it's actually, uh, I think, Valley View Drive yeah. is the one. But uh, so yeah, this would 
address the four and a quarter miles in poor condition. These numbers do not include anything for those unpaved roads. That would be a separate thing. They'd have to uh, petition for those. Yeah. That's not included in the numbers. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, we can have these sent to you if you want, but uh, that's why we need your name and then an email address. I think, uh, or else we can put it on the website and you can grab it. Madam Mayor, that's what I was going to say. We'll, we'll yeah. get this put on the website next and to then, the agenda item so you can watch the video and see the presentation. Yeah, I think that's the be better way is that if we put it on the website, there's a place and then you can, everybody can access it. Yeah. So that's an overview of kind of the budget impact. Now I'll talk about staff recommendation. Uh, staff are recommending that we move forward with improvements, uh, the overlay and the reconstruction slash reclamation, put those into the capital improvement plan, and staff recommend that we assess the improvements 40% uh, consistent with um, other areas of the city that are urban. Um, we'd also recommend that they be assessed on that per lot basis that I explained earlier. Um, and again, we'd want to phase the improvements in over a period of years through the capital improvement plan. Um, while I talk about recommendation, I will just give you um, a little bit before we go into discussion. Um, we have received a number of written comments. I've gotten quite a few emails, phone calls. Uh, a lot of that feedback through those channels has been mostly in favor of option 1A, which is what staff is recommending, which is improvements with a 40% assessment. Uh, there were a few people that wanted thin overlay uh, just because it was, you know, not assessed. And um, also a lot of the feedback from people th through email and phone was, uh, they want it assessed on a per lot basis and not based on frontage uh, because there is a large disparity in the different frontages of the mm -hmm. lot. So some have tons of frontage, yeah. some have almost no frontage. But a really, but a really deep lot. Yeah, but a really deep, big lot. Yeah. Um, and then I got a consistent amount of feedback on please don't widen or change the geometry of the streets, which staff are not recommending. We're recommending working with them as they sit today, not wide them or narrow them, just work with them as they are. Yeah. Uh, and then I had a couple people asking, uh, you know, why aren't you discussing utilities? And I walked them yeah. through yeah. that we're just looking at repairing the streets, not extending utilities. That's right. So uh, with that, I'll move to the discussion phase. And my slide here just kind of overviews some of the stuff you've been you've seen. So, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that you might say, okay, so when we go into this phasing, Ryan, um, so you'll do how many miles per per year down in that area on on either the recon or the rehab? Our goal would be to get to the rehab as quickly as we can so we can conserve the pavements that are there. The pavements that are already shot, for lack yeah. of a better word, we wouldn't have as much of a hurry on that because we don't, those, the condition is such that we can't resurface them effectively. So we, we do the resurfacing hopefully in the next year or two, and then we would put in the reclaim for uh, several years out um, to, we still have to do some pothole filling. But yeah. basically the likely scenario of funding this is if we came in with some good bids on other projects, we'd be using those savings to try to help um, complete these types of improvements. Okay, because that was my concern, because we have a capital improvements plan, mm -hmm. and we already have plans for all of the other streets Correct. around the city that mm -hmm. needs to be uh, rehabilitated, and we've gone through the process already. We started it last September? Um, yeah, middle yeah. of the year, yep. And we've gone through um, A1 and all of those uh, processes. So I don't know how it's going to impact all of the scheduled work already. The earliest anything would occur would be 2019. Okay. So, so, this, this so would then be you're going to have to redo your budget to look at 2019 uh, then. Correct. Because 2018 is already done right. and approved. Our focus would be on trying to get 
trying to find a way to resurface the roads that can be resurfaced in 2019 and then schedule out the reclaim further. Okay. If and I think one of the things that you would need to let us know is how that's going to play out and how that's going to have an effect on all of the other streets that are already scheduled. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. And yeah, if we chose to go this route, we'd also have to rework the policy a little bit. We need time to ensure that. So, that when you're so. talking about reworking the policy, are we going lot rather than uh, front footage? Um, I, I think the policy already uh, has that type of discussion. The main part of the policy would be going from petition and 100% assessments to 40, 60, and the city can um, start to yeah. recommend a so project So we're itself. just changing it to the assessment level of 40, 60, rather than 100%. And would, the city would have the ability to go ahead and recommend improvements without a petition as well. That would be the two well, primary Well, we'll find choices. out from well, them okay. whether Fair they enough. want that. Fair I, enough. I'm not going yep, to go no. down that road. If they, if they want to hold that petition mm -hmm. again, can hold that... Yep. Uh, as part of their control, mm -hmm. yeah. that's, the, yeah. The city attorney advised us if we're going to start implementing projects and doing that, we just need to make sure that our policy indicates what we're doing as opposed to having an exception. So, oh, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I agree. Okay. Dan. I have a question. When, you, when we look at lots, you mentioned that some of these have uh, small frontages. Yes. And, and deep lots. And, and deep lots. And so we determined there's six lots there because of what they have, but... The only access to those lots is through that primary small mm -hmm. frontage. How do we assess that? I mean, it's, well, do, do they have to give up right away to other for, for other lots now, or? I mean, well, we did that uh, in uh, North River Hills when we had one come in and we had th three lots, but they had to enter, and then that became a common road. Do you remember this is down by Rio Lane? But I can certainly. Around. Yeah, but we can. We can. I, I just so want to make sure thing, we're not like taking or something. You know, oh no, 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 no! I, I because if they want to split up their lot because it'll be owned by the one property yeah. owner, that's mm -hmm. what happened down in, in in North River Hills. So and they want to sell it, then they're going to dedicate mm -hmm. that road, and then and the other part of the policy, it's down in Southwest Burnsville, uh, if they have. Um, city services, it's one acre lot. But if they have their own services, then it's two acres. So that determines how many lots. Great? R correct? Correct. So okay. we got Chateau Highlands and Forest Park Heights are one acre lots because they have um, city utilities and yeah. curb and gutter. So th those areas are in the regular plan now. That's right. And then the ones that have, don't have utilities are, are not. Yeah. And maybe the easiest way to answer this would be any lot up to four acres would likely have the one lot okay. designation because they can't split. Mm -hmm. Once the lots get over four, then we'd start looking at is it, mm -hmm. can you split into two, three, four, that type of thing. How many do we have out there over four, do you know? Do you remember that, John? Um, not a, no. Who has more than four acres out there? <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, name and address, please. Okay. And you have how many acres? I have just over four. You just, okay, just over four. Okay. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Sure. Gentleman over here as well. Yeah. So, you have 18 acres. Okay. Okay. Name again, so she has <coughs> George Duffy Estate. George Duffy Estate, okay. All right, thank you. And to answer your question, um, I don't know exactly, but it's somewhere around 10 that are over that. Okay. Uh, the remainder of the lots are under that, which we'd treat as one lot. One lot. Yeah. Yep. And then also, it's my understanding that when we did judicial, there was a per lot yeah. assessment yeah. methodology. So yeah. this would be consistent with that. Yeah. Yeah. As well as actually also, just remembered, um, when these streets were built or were paved, it was a per lot as well. Down in southwest Burnsville. southwest Burnsville. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'll just bring up two points. <clears throat> From a public works perspective, the, um, a couple of key aspects. We have to spend an inordinate amount of time down here patching because 
we, the streets aren't on our plan, so they keep deteriorating, and, and the folks want some service out there. They, they want to improve streets, but they can't get it without a petition. So just so you're aware, we do spend more dollars per <coughs> lane mile out here on patching than we do elsewhere because that's the only I think I'd, li I'd like to see what those numbers are so that when we, when, the, when we talk with our residents, we understand what that is per mile uh, every year that you're out there patching. And wouldn't it be much better if you did a reclaim or a rehab? Right. It, it will it'll be somewhat difficult to quantify, but, um, of course, the residents don't see mm -hmm. that cost. So the, yeah. the, the, no, the, I understand. The general taxpayers but as a whole But everybody. Do. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the other point I was just going to bring out is the gravel roads will cost us more to maintain than, than paved roads. Uh, no, just I've heard that before, too. too. So just so you're aware of those couple items. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Your Bob name? Bob Ward, Bob. 1304 Circle High Drive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Would it be easier if, if they came up? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you come to the table and, uh, and, and then so the people at home can also see you? Yeah, I was wondering uh, if this project you can doesn't sit down go chair, in sir. until yeah. uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to those roads in the meantime, in between time? Ryan? Will they be patched? Will they be filled with that garbage that they normally put in in the winter time that flies all over the place? Or, or what's going to happen there? It, it will be partially dependent upon what we decide to do. If it's just going to be patched, if, you know, if, if we decide we're going to stick with the same policy, and um, we're, we're, the only way that improvements are going to be done is via petition, then you'll see continued patching. If, it, if we know it's going to have a chance to be resurfaced, we'll look at different alternative methods to get it through. Um, I don't see a seal coating. I think that's what you're talking about, where you put the oil down and then the, the rock over the top. Uh, most of those roads are not good candidates for seal coating at this point because they've been out there so long. No, because we... Uh, what would you like us to do? Excuse me? What would you like us to do? Well, the thing is there's some craters in those streets, mm -hmm. and it just passed my arm. Yep. And it's just before you go up one of the big hills. Agreed. And those holes are humongous. Mm -hmm. So something has to be done. So you'd like for us to reclaim Some kind those of patching roads? until they can get the rest of the job done. Okay, mm -hmm. you want us to go to the reclaim or reconstruction of those roads. And next year you want better patching so that crater that you go over. Absolutely. Okay. That's, Something's I'm just done. trying to understand who wants what. Yeah. I don't know about the other people that okay. live on that street, but yeah. 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 it's yeah. terrible. <laughs> okay. So you, you understand that's the yeah. assessments yeah. associated with that? Yeah. Uh, I have 1304 Circle High Drive. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Come, uh, so we're going to have you sit here. So because no, no, because then everybody can see you at home. Yeah, twelve twenty Circle High Drive, Emerson. You can sit here. Yeah, I just have an observation about the patchwork. Yeah, when they came through last year and did the patchwork, I was like, were they blind? Do they have dark sunglasses on? Because they missed so much. That a couple of us had to call back, like, did you not see this side of the road? Did you not see this? So it's not like they were coming back because more issues were happening. They did a kind of a miss job. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was their supervisor, I'd be like, you got to look at both sides. The and whole this way. is our contractor, Ryan, because, no. or did we do that? This would be city forces. Okay. It wasn't their best job. All right, we will work on improving. Okay, now do you want the reconstruction or rehab? I'm a logical person. This is what I want to understand. When you first paved the road, which was what, 1990? Practically. Practically. Yeah, way back. In 1990, how long was that road going to last? 20 years? 25? Mm -hmm. That's the... 20 is kind of the typical yeah. for a 20 is a typical, yeah. the typical yeah. depending on yep. how much going mm -hmm. around. So it's done more than that. Yep. Okay, and that's probably because it's a cul-de-sac versus, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so this, it's done its shelf life. So once you have its shelf life, then this road, you know, how long can you patch it? You said probably yeah. up to five years, and then you're going to have to tear it up. 
Well, no, the five years, I was talking, if we did a thin overlay, <laughs> that would last maybe five to ten years. Yeah. Mm. So that's if we just basically mm -hmm. put an inch and a half over all of it okay, yeah. for now. Mm -hmm. But if you just did nothing and you just kept patching it, yeah. how long, how estimate you're saying maybe five-ish more years you could get out of it? Yeah, and then and it, we get to the point where it goes back to gr gr gravel. I'm gonna, I, there, I think you had a comment, and then Heather, you had a comment, and then we'll... It was hard to hear at the time he was speaking, so yeah. that's why I'm trying to yeah. get this. So right now, what you're suggesting with the part, the A, yeah. that you said most residents want, that is kind of doing a thick part over it, right? Maybe yeah, yeah. Last but, but 10 doing plus some substantial years. patching before we put that on. But that's so. not curb or anything. That's just... Oh, no, 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 no. no. So... If five years came down the road and, and somebody was to say, you now have to do your well because this person's well is bad, that investment kind of went down the pot, right? And take that would be a really <coughs> difficult thing for us to do because when you're going to have one person wanting to have uh, private, uh, to have city utilities, oh good. my. Yeah, this the well water there is perfect, so I don't see yeah, anybody no, because. Most all of you down in in Southwest Burnsville have your own private service, your your wells and we your like and your. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not and I don't that. and I don't see us t touching any of that, right. and that's why it had to be a hundred percent. And I, I just, know that because I've been here when we did that sure policy. That residents are doing maintaining their septic, so right, or yeah. is it an honor system? No. Yeah, this the state. Is. Yeah, or so the state. yeah, okay. But, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Dan and then Heather. I was going to say, this isn't an indicator how long the road will last, but in Leisure Estates in 2015, we got a new road. It was 47 years old when yeah. we got our new road. That's how long it lasted. So, yeah. Some of them last longer, some of them don't. The ones in the 80s yeah. don't last near as long as the ones built earlier. And mm -hmm. It's just a materials yeah, issue, I believe. Heather? Madam Mayor, just a, just a note on the patching, and I'm going to ask Ryan to correct me if, if I misspeak, but my understanding is is that, you know, the more that we do this patching, the less effective it That's is. That's right. Also, we have a, a – um, we don't have a lot of people doing this patching, and so I think sometimes, you know, you bring the materials based on the report, and you get out there, and you have to come back because, you know, you don't – you, you can't necessarily and if there's a rain, do all of that. It washes away. And, and one final point on the patching <laughs> is that the, this – the people doing the patching do it all over the city, and so we have it um, all over the place. The one thing I do want to comment on the septic, so I don't, if I've misspoken, I'll let Ryan correct me, but, um, and then on the septic, we are, um, the council entered into an agreement with the county to try and get them to, to make mm -hmm. sure that those inspections are happening to, because we just don't have the um, expertise in that area, and so... Um, I'd have We've to check never, about when that yeah. happened, but it was sometime within the last year or two. That's right. We do not have the, the personnel for that, and it's the county and the state. And th those are health issues, the public health. Yes, yeah, yes, ma'am. And we don't have public that. Health, but I do believe we have it in our ordinance as yeah. well that requires the inspection. It's just yeah. that we're contracting to make sure that I add one more about it. the septic. Sure. Um, when we sell houses with septic a lot quite often, these days under the new codes, they're not passing. And it's costing people seventeen or twenty thousand dollars to replace their septics and things like that, to, so they can sell their house. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are failing the inspections these days. Once they finally get out to them, well, in order to sell the home, that's something they have to do. Uh, well, I, yeah. I understand that. I'm just, just I'm just letting people know <laughs> yeah. that it's, yeah. they're they're failing okay. more often these days. I'm going to go to him first, and then I'll come back to you. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Did you want? Okay. Since we're not okay. here to talk about septics, but I'm Mark Savard. I live at 2712 North Loop Road. I grew up back there. I mm -hmm. built my house mm -hmm. in 98. Um, so I paid for the last assessment. I don't think that road lasted six to eight years. Spider cracked all over the whole road. Okay. What I would like to see is the full construction like they did on Judicial Road. Okay. But I would like to see a cap for some of these individuals that have several acres yeah and and we said it do it by lot and so that's that's the 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 recommendation would rather than front footage lots on front footage or no. would you go by their deep lots as well because i, yeah, I the still deep think lots. there should be a cap yeah okay that's something we can have a conversation about and i know that we do pay a substantial amount in property taxes back there so i think mm -hmm. that should be said too okay uh, Ryan? If you do cap them, then everyone else will pay more. So the, yeah. the ones that have smaller then would, also, would have to pay more to make up for a cap. Yeah. So we have to do it fair and equitable for everyone. 
So let's make sure that we address all of those issues. And as far as the patching, I'm tired of seeing all the chunks of asphalt from the plows in my yard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Patching, patching those streets is very difficult. There's not much material there to begin with. So it's difficult when you're not patching three inches of asphalt or four inches of asphalt that we just put down two inches over the top of it to knock down dust. And, and if something is done so, as far as reconstruction, they need a better base under the road. There's tree roots under the roads. There's stumps that were paved over in 98 when they did this job that it's popping up through the asphalt. I, we totally agree. This, this was when the project occurred. It was not a full-on build the yeah. road like we would build any other road in town. It was attempt to uh, get rid of gravel for a while, and then the, the understanding was if we need to do something, we'd have everyone would have to come through with a petition again. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the petitions aren't coming through, and people are complaining, and yeah. that's why we're here. Yeah. So I just thought, I'd like to see a construction, but I know a lot of people aren't going to be on board because of their acreage. So. Well, and the other thing is that what I'm hearing from staff is that we do it over a period of time, so so the price isn't that huge. Well, the price to the city would be spread out. Yeah, the, the price to the city and the assessments can be spread out as well because we can also have people uh, put yeah. their assessments on a... Up uh, to 15 years. Yeah, for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, come forward now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm Carol Meyer, and I live uh, 3113 South yeah. Loop Road. Yeah. And I appreciate the offer of spread out. Yeah. But at the same time, I want to remind you that at the end of the day, we still pay for it. So yeah, we it still all, comes. That's, that's right. right. We all pay we for it. We all pay for it. But those of us that have acreage, we pay a little bit more. And that's my question right now. I probably have a couple more questions later, but um, I wrote down some things, and I did email you about this, but I didn't get a response. So um, <clears throat> I, for one, I guess my question is, is that if a single-family property owner is targeted to be assessed for more than one lot, but yet they don't use that road or they don't degrade that road any more than somebody on one acre, mm -hmm. okay? So when we look at, now we pay for a water bill. Mm -hmm. We don't use that, but yet the residents on Loop Road pay for that just like everybody else because we contribute to it because mm -hmm. we all gain from mm -hmm. stormwater drain off. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand that. But I look at this as the same kind of a thing. It's like, well, I don't know why I should be assessed more just because I have a larger lot. And I look at it as, hey, other people even benefit from a larger lot because there's open space there. The other question I have is, now, I'm a borderline larger lot. There's some people that have really big mm -hmm. lots, so they're going to be assessed a lot. That forces people into dividing and things like that, that maybe their neighbors really don't want to see that happen. But... <clears throat> Um, I guess my point is is that um, um, with with that lot, like I said, we don't we don't drive on it any more than anybody else does. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm questioning as to why we should be <laughs> assessed for it in that way. Yeah. Well, it's no different than the folks who live on corner lots in, in, in around Burnsville. Right. And so they're assessed a little bit more than others sure. and they don't drive anymore it is the way that when uh well the, the way that this has been put in place was it in 1980 ryan when we put the 1990 90 yeah <coughs> you, I, yeah you want to sure the, the it's based upon benefit not more, not number of vehicle trips mm -hmm. so larger lots generally have larger frontages yeah so a poor looking road n negatively affects that lot more than it does a smaller lot. So vice versa, if you improve the road, it generally has a bigger lot. It generally, the increase is also larger because it's more framed by the street because it has so much frontage. That's okay. the- I, I can appreciate that premise and I can appreciate the premise with corner lots, but <clears throat> just because something is always generally done doesn't mean that in this situation it holds true. We have people back where we live that the only frontage that they have is a driveway, but mm -hmm. yet they're sitting on 10 acres. Mm -hmm. So it's like mm -hmm. it doesn't depreciate their value at all mm -hmm. because it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I that the other thing that I want to point out is now 
we live on just barely four acres, so maybe we're dividable, maybe we aren't dividable. We don't know until we go to divide it. Mm -hmm. We had other neighbors a few years back that had more acreage than we did. They went to divide and found out the city said, no, sorry, you can't. So I would like to know if, if I'm going to be assessed for more than one lot, mm -hmm. am I going to be guaranteed then that I have a buildable lot, mm -hmm. that, that I have mm -hmm. two buildable lots? You know, lots Carol, that's, that's very question. good. So one of the things as we gather all of the information, and staff can take a look at all of that, and then we can come back and we can <coughs> also take a look at uh, the fair uh, and equitable way of looking at all of these things. Especially when, you know, because I walked down uh, uh, Southwest Burnsville, and you're right, I've, I've walked up driveways that go on and on and on. So the the, the front the, the front footage on the front side is minimal. It's just only the the, the right. driveway, and but it and goes the, very deep. Yes, and there are people that have one acre that have more frontage than yep. somebody else who has yeah. a dozen I, acres. Yeah. So it, 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 when you compare it to the corner lot, yeah. it really doesn't hold true in our neighborhood is yeah. what I'm saying. And these are things why it's been really difficult throughout the years. But we can, we can take, we're gathering all of that information and we can come up with something and have discussions with all of you and how that works. I'm going to go to Ryan and then back to you. Right. If you have less than, you, you need 200 foot of frontage, so if you have less than 400 feet of frontage or less than four acres, you automatically just be one lot. Or if, if half your lot's a wetland, then you aren't going to be able to have enough That's room right. for uh, two, a septic system plus a backup area. Yeah. So w we would do that kind of analysis on the larger lots before yeah. going And that also some of those lots that have really steep drops yeah. that there is just no way that that's going to be buildable. And I've been back there where there are lots that it looks really big, but then you only go so much and mm -hmm. then, yep. then there's a huge drop. Dan. Well, I remember years ago we were dealing with, uh, I think, park dedication fees and that from the days when the city was developing, and a lot of things got deferred for the farmers because the farmers couldn't afford the entire assessment that was going to come at them. And we started charging. Didn't we charge after they replatted, and then we charged the different fees and that on it? And is this something where we can well, I think these defer things... some of that where when, when, once you replat it and you sell it or whatever, yes. then, then, that, then you assess that and it's there on your property, well, so that you pay that. And instead of doing it all at once, that's because you may, never, you may never replant it, or that's right. you may turn it in, and that's a two-acre deal, I you used, may turn it into a bunch I of I use the lots. example, too, of the water bill, because mm -hmm. it's like we pay a base fee, but if you hook up to water and sewer, mm -hmm. then you pay the additional fee. Mm -hmm. So if you decide to divide and build, then you could be assessed mm -hmm. an additional fee that could go into the, into the kitty for yeah. maintenance or whatever mm -hmm. kind of thing. But it's like, well... What if I sit there and I don't divide my property mm -hmm. for another 10 years? Well, the road is shot by then. Yeah. Why don't we uh, take all of this information because we won't make that decision tonight, Sure, Carol. I just, I, I if, guess if I'm we're just, gathering information yes, before I'm, we move forward yeah, with any I'm, of I'm this. I'm just bringing it up. Yeah. So then moving on, the other thing I have is, um, is the blacktop. And... I'm, I'm wondering if you can clarify a little bit more about this again. Is now the blacktop that went down there before, and I understand that was just a thin layer, bituminous dust control, but yet, you know, until the last few years, it hasn't done that bad. In fact, there hasn't really been a lot of patching out until then. Yes, there was a couple of spots here and there where, like, there's the tree growing up from it and things like that. But for the most part, it's like it's lasted a good 15 years or more. But the, but the ones that you're talking about now, we're talking about <coughs> the cost is higher, which I guess we can expect, but it's not lasting as long. At least you're not predicting it to last as long. Uh, the overlay strategy would, right. wouldn't predict to last as long. Mm -hmm. um, the reconstruction reclamation we do believe would last 20 years, at which time we could even resurface them. But, but when you're looking at the, the, when you're looking at that kind of a project, you're talking about really a lot of money. Which was, is it because there was just gravel down be below before or? Why the difference? Because you mean between overlay and reconstruction? Yes. The big difference? Yeah, it's because. No, I'm I'm talking oh. about the 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 reconstruction and the price that we would have to pay for mm -hmm. reconstruction compared to what we had done before. 
and how long it lasted. So we can't really compare what we had done before because that lasted is almost 20 years, and you're talking about like an overlay is only going to cost is only going to last five or ten years depending upon the overlay. If we do a reconstruction, it will last about the same amount of time as it did before. Yeah, if you look at the the area, the cost per unit area on it, um, the the life cycle cost of the overlay would be cheaper meaning the average cost per year of that project would be cheaper than uh, replacement. Um, right. If you take, because it's a lot more expensive, and even if you spread it over that 20 years, yeah. it's higher. I, so I, it's more, more economical to do the overlay. From yes, I, I understand that. But what I'm trying to understand is, is the product that was put down before, okay, that lasted a lot of years compared to what you're estimating the first ah. two new, new choices are. It's like, I get the third yep. choice will yep. last yep. that, but that's skyrocketing no, I, price. No, I think I got you okay. now. So the reason is, um, so gravel is more flexible. You put the blacktop on top of it, and then that basically moves with it. Whereas when you do an overlay, it, it performs differently when you're putting a layer of blacktop over an old layer of blacktop. The old blacktop has is more rigid in general. It's got cracks in it. Um, when you do the overlay, uh, the major cracks will come through pretty quick, but then the little smaller cracks take a lot longer. So it's because um, existing pavement behaves differently than gravel. Okay. Which, I, I, that that answers question. my question, but I, it yep. just, I, I just yep. couldn't get my head around that. Yep, that gravel <laughs> is just more flexible. Yeah. And okay, so thank that's you. Why. And then I have one other question, and it came from a friend of mine that lives in Shakopee. And I don't have any idea about this, but I'm just going to throw it out there because I just want some thought put into it. She told me, I'm sorry, she didn't live in Shakopee, it's Savage. But she told me that in Savage, they were redoing some roads. And in her neighborhood, they found out that the price was going to be way higher in their neighborhood because of the time span in which it was done. So depending upon... The, the circle of time, the, the price is up or down kind of thing. Does that reflect on our neighborhood? I don't does, think Does that so. make sense? No, it, it doesn't make sense. And you know what? We have a very good relationship with the city of Savage. Okay. We'll check those all out. Yeah, no, I was just curious because yeah. she, said, yeah. she said for them, it, they, they, had a, they had a group that looked into it, and she said it made a lot of difference. <laughs> so instead of just one part of the city having to have the higher end because they were the last ones at the end, they looked at it and they said, no, we're going we're gonna to spread this out for everybody to enjoy. So it, I, it doesn't make sense to us and okay. how we do streets. And the thing is, we well, also have to Well, I would try to look into that a little them. bit more. And maybe we so, have a different procedure here. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. I'll look into it a little bit more and see yeah. what I can and find out. And it's easy for us to, to also uh, call the City of Savage and find out what. Well, so what's the that. neighborhood, Carol? Um, down on like Lynn Path and down that area. Yeah, give us some more information. Give it to Ryan. Okay. We'll make sure that we get uh, good, clear information. Oh, I was just asked if I should give an opinion on which option. Yes, and, yes. And I, I, I am at, asking at, everybody at that. This, at this point, I don't have any objections to the proposed option. Okay. Um, I, I, again, some of that is kind of like how much we get assessed on it because mm -hmm. it's like, if we're going to be assessed at a really high rate, then I guess I would like to go with the cheaper option. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we have a whole year to go through yes. all of this. Yeah, yeah. No, I get And we're that. gathering information from all of you. Yeah. And I guess really at the end of the day, dollars and cents count. Yes, absolutely. So. The other thing that you can also uh, rely on is that we have a very good AAA bond rating from all to from uh, both uh, Moody's and Standard and Poor's. It's sense. a good thing. We are in a strong financial position, so we get good rates. Okay, that's we like to know that. Yeah, <laughs> and I think you ought to know that because no, I uh, I, I do. I I follow yeah. that and I appreciate yeah. that. But okay. it's just kind of like, well, you know, yeah, I'm looking out for my neighborhood and for myself. And, uh, <laughs> we look out for the whole city of Burnsville. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Uh, Lance, yes. Name and address for the record. Yes. Lance Free, 15401 Oriole Court. Um, first of all, I'd like to say 
that I was part of the original, original. Uh, petitioners yeah. that went out and gathered signatures for you, the overlay walked. that Steve O'Malley put together mm -hmm. as a courtesy to us for safety reasons and as a way to save the city money on its maintenance costs. And so there was nothing done to the base. That's right. It was just overlaid on the existing road. There was no extension. Mm -hmm. There was nothing except the overlay done. Mm -hmm. And it lasted a long time. It's not 20 years. It's 28 years that that road's been there. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, we've only had one seal coat during that entire time. So that road's really done its job. And it's not the residents that are ruining the road. It's the garbage trucks and the curbs are because of the city plows. And we don't have curbs down in your oh, area. Oh, no, I have curb. You have curb have down in the asphalt. entire street. Oh, oh, as, oh it's they do. It's bituminous curb. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, bituminous, because I was going to say. The city plows come down and they do their curb to curb, you know, snow extraction removal? of the snow. And they scrape off a good section of the curb. So one of the things, and, and I've had many conversations with the man sitting in the back there, and he's been extremely compliant and understanding in what we're doing and what we're asking for. But uh, our curbs are deteriorating faster than some of our roads. And what I'm talking about is where the curb comes down and meets the street. Mm -hmm. So the, the water that runs down our streets are getting back behind that and eroding that area. So I'm not sure how that's going to be rectified with any of the plans that you guys have done, except for total re reclamation. I, I can speak to yeah. that. Good. Um, we were, with any of the strategies we proposed, basically kind of milling off that curb, and then when we repave, there's a shoe they can put on the paver, so we can put bituminous curb back where it was before, but and that would be how we would... The, the patching that we've had in the past has been asphalt banged in with a couple of hammers and some stuff that has given a resemblance of a curb, but not a real curb. And one of the things that I worry about, Ryan, is if, if, if the residents chose a one-inch overlay, would there be any engineering involved in that at all? Would there be any kind of scratch done on the existing roads to make the new overlay adhere better? Uh, would there be anything done because it's really uneven right now there's <laughs> tons of bumps and holes and things that make the road really uneven where, basically where where the road has um failed totally we patched we just remove that and patch it in and then we just resurface right over the top there'll be no changes to the how um the undulations or the changes okay, so where right. there's a, a new section you guys have put in which you've done in a number of places where you've taken out 100 feet mm -hmm. and put in a new road that still gets a one inch overlay over it and so it's going to be up an inch higher than the rest of the road because it's uh, already an inch higher with the paver you know they would be able to um tear it in so okay. it, it's not okay. going to be like a uh yeah. You know, step up, well, but it, it would be a small and, bump. And, you know, I walk my dog every morning uh, around the loop, and so I'm very familiar with every square foot of what it looks like out there. And there's sections where there's nothing more than pieces of asphalt held together by gravel below that. And if you put a one-inch overlay over that, it's not going to last for more than a month before the first garbage truck goes through. But you're saying that you would remove that stuff? Yeah, um, Madam Mayor, maybe just yes. looking at the graph there, um, we, we showed option two as an option, obviously, yeah. but yeah. considering the city's investment of 780000 compared to, for that option, mm -hmm. compared to the amount we'd have to invest in option mm -hmm. one, it doesn't financially make a lot of sense for us to just That's do right. a small overlay when we could, you know, do get, the get complete a work and do it well and do it mm -hmm. right. Good, good. Well, th that answers a lot of questions. The one question I still have is, how are you going to determine which option is going to be chosen? Uh, we will continue to discuss with yeah. our decision makers. What we what what would you like to have done? A re reclaim? Well, I'm I'm pretty selfish because I'm probably not going to live there more than maybe five more years until I get into something that old people can handle better than you know a great big <laughs> lot full of trees that I have to take down. So um, you mean you don't want to do snow removal and and, and, and landscaping? Work. Yeah, and, and, you know, and over an acre is kind of a hard thing to do. So I would probably opt for the one inch option if it was done, you know, with the quality of removing some of the 
stuff that's already there. And I think that's the cheapest often option to the city at this point. Well, I don't believe it's going to last five no, years. No, it's not going to last, but we would have invested uh, $780,000 from every citizen in the city. I understand that. So and let's I, take I, a look we, at it and be be reasonable, well, even though you're not be going reasonable. to be there for five more years. But you may. But, but I also agree with a lot of the points that Carol made. Yeah. That, you know, and I really do appreciate the city looking at it on a per lot basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way we did it originally. Yeah. yeah. And it was only $1,500 per lot at that point. Obviously, the times have changed in 20-some years, and so prices go up. We understand that. Um, I don't think that your prices for reclamation are out of line if they're a per-lot basis. I think that's a real reasonable amount of money to spend. And so I appreciate the city doing that for us. I also agree with her that we pay a lot of fees that we don't use. I mean, we don't get a lot of city services out where we are. Roads are the most important things to us because... We don't use fire service. We don't use police service. We're pretty much, I'm part of a contingent of five retired police officers that moved out there just because it was a and great place. And you keep place. it all safe out there. It's a great place to live. It's quiet and it's secure and we don't bother each other. You know, everybody out there. How many acres do you have again? I just have two. You have two. But I, and I agree with Carol with, the people that have Carol's lot is is this wide, but it's that deep, mm -hmm. and she's not going to be able to build another house on that lot. So I would say that the the, the definition of buildable lot is very important. Yeah, yeah. and very we'll important. take a look at that. Yeah, because and if that can and, and, be determined yeah. to be, you know, it's feasible, it's it's yeah. it's achievable. Mm -hmm. Then okay, um, and we have a lot of people that have been out there. I, I'm I've been there thirty plus years. I'm still seen as a yuppie uh, <laughs> intruder because there's people that have been there generations, yeah. and they are land rich and cash poor, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a real burden on some of those people. Okay. So, uh, thank you for your consideration. Yeah. Appreciate and what you're doing. It's good for us to hear all of those, okay. you know, input, and we'll we're taking it all in. Anybody else that has something different? Yes, please come over and give us your name and address. <coughs> at UA 1212 Circle High Drive. Uh, my question okay, she is... Asks, uh, yeah, a name again. You said it so fast. UE. E -U -E. E -U -E. Um, can different areas choose different options? I mean, you aren't going to use the same option on all four miles, are yeah. you? Like Circle High Drive might not need the same thing as Loop Road. Okay, Ryan. The, the See, maps they're there. the engineers. Yeah. The map can really help. Yeah, there you go. John, yeah. So you it. have well, red. Colors mean so to answer your question, um, if we were to instruct you to move forward with improvements, staff would evaluate <laughs> what we would want to do. But here's what our preliminary recommendation is, is to do overlay on some of the streets and then reconstruct some of them. So we'd look at them individually okay. and apply the mm -hmm. option that's best for that street. All right. And, and you can go to the website and pull this all up so you know what, where you are what, and yeah. what that option okay. is. And you were sure. on Circle High? Circle High, yeah. Then um, just, that we'd recommend doing. We're the only the one on the other side of the street. Ah, yeah. I see. I think yeah. everybody else has got sewer and water around us except for Circle yeah. High. So yours is an overlay. Yeah. Recommend Pretty that. much decided. We get to choose well, two we would, one inch. We would do further investigation to make sure that this yeah. recommendation is good but this is based on our information what we'd recommend and okay. you, we haven't decided anything okay okay this is staff's um after all of the work that they've done that's what they're they they're proposing but you know we're collecting information sure. from all of you before a decision is made okay you'll have another notice when we have another discussion about this particular item okay we do everything very transparent Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, please, Dave. Yeah, I'm not going to make you move. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So that. So. Uh, I'm fine. I'll talk no, no, because so that uh, yeah, the people at home can hear you. And then uh, your address for the record <coughs> and everybody. Dave Giles, 2110 Alcana Lane. Um, I think you kind of answered the question about uh, <coughs> if you're going to do it kind of per street or per area. Because we live on Alcana, it's a short street. It's really in, in reasonably good shape. Um, 
I know that uh, Public Works Street Department did some a little bit overlaying last year because there were some rough areas yeah. going in there, um, and it seemed like it shorted it up really well. So, yeah. where's uh, Alcana, John? I think the it's um, this little street here. No, no, oh, wait, Alcana. I'm sorry. Right off Judicial there, yeah, a little dead end oh, street. Yeah. So basically. Um, I guess the other question I have is I'm not trying to put any more workload on Dan, but you know, are, are you guys thinking about or Public Works thinking about uh, paving some of it yourself? I know you have a paver. I know they uh, do some partnering with Egan with their their self-propelled paver. Is that something that's like I said? I'm not trying to pile anything on them, but I know they did did it last year with the, with the Egan paver, or whatever, or rental paver. It worked out great. I know it saved the city money, so. Um, it's I, I, th I think with the s smaller streets like that, it makes it a lot easier, you know, because you can handle handle doing that. So, agreed. We got uh, your street, and then I can't remember what's the name of the other court that was. So uh, Crest. Well, Crest. Mayor's right next to and us. Crest, yeah. and yeah, so that road, we we did do some edge to edge resurfacing, and that just isn't sustainable yeah. for the street that's department. On, that's reconstruction and reclaim. Right. Yeah, so both Elkan and the other street, those would definitely be moved out towards the end of it, but it was about, that was even thinner than what we proposed on option two. So that's probably got five years in there that it that it um, went over. But we just, we can't sustain that over all those streets. We just can't do that. And I that's, understand that. He, yeah. Dan wanted to try to get us through a point because right. I mean, they were literally falling apart. Right. So if, if we're told that um, we're not going to be managing the streets, um, with out petitions, then we're going to have to, we can't continue to do that on all the roads. Okay, well, I think it's reasonable to go case by case since we're on a short street. Um, I'm just one person on that street, but uh, we've lived there for 30 some years too, and I believe that we would certainly be looking at the inch and a half overlay. We'd be happy with something like that because it's held up. Our base seems to be good. I mean, that base has been there. My dad used to grade the roads there, so it's been there a long time, and actually my grandpa. So um, it's got a good base, and uh, there's no reason why we would have to go and uh, overhaul it, really. I think we can get by another 10-plus years on a, a one-and-a-half-inch overlay. But I'm just speaking for our area, and like I said, I'm just one one little speck on the, the street. Your, yours for sure wouldn't be in the 2019 project. Okay. Thank you. It's, you know, it's, it, it, this is what we want to do is hear from you and then, you know, when do we schedule those out? Right. No, no I understand that. And I know that we're kind of on our own island, so to speak, down there. As Lance said, everybody <laughs> enjoys being down there. Um, 40, 50 turkey every day That's when you drive down you the alone. street. <laughs> uh, and deer all over. It's, it's great. So, and I know the city's done a great job. Um, but I also know, too, that... Um, for whatever reason, the taxes are higher. Not saying it's the city, but I know the county gets their cut, and so does the school district. But um, <coughs> as he's, as Lance said, also too, we don't use a lot of yeah. services. So, um, and I think I guess, you all are Lakeville School District. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I should send a thank you to Two them. Two high schools, yeah. we only have one. Yeah, no, I know, I yeah. know. So, but we appreciate all the yeah. listening and all the everything you've yeah. done. So, yeah. services. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. It. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for all the information. Oh, okay, C name and address for the record. Yes. Okay, Gary Emerson, twelve seventeen Circle High Drive. Okay. Now the uh, he, when they were talking, he was talking with a inside voice, and I couldn't. He should have uh, been talking with an yeah. outside voice. Yeah. Uh, the um, the options that we have was do nothing, or patch it. And then put a light overlay over it. Yeah. That's okay. or give a full-on resurface yeah. on a, like a, we would on other streets in town. Okay. And what did what did did they suggest for uh, Circle High Drive? Uh, our suggestion would be to patch the areas that are falling apart and then fully resurface it with two inches of uh, uh, overlay. Overlay which, for which is, Circle High. Wh which yeah. is the which is the light? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, the overlay would be uh, some fairly significant patching of the bad areas and then a two-inch overlay, so uh, a thicker layer than the thin overlay option. But less than reconstruction. 
-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, less than and construction. less than reclamation. Because there's some parts on Circle High that have really fallen apart, but there's a fair amount of the road that still is halfway decent. So that's kind of how we're picking whether the. Well, when you're showing that picture of uh, Circle High Drive, you're actually showing the part right in front of my house, which is the hill, the steep hill that comes down. Oh yeah. And last year, the plow took my entire curb off, and they had to replace it. And oftentimes, they're chewing it up as, for whatever reason as they're doing it. So that's one of the reasons why it's kind of a mess along there. Yeah. And, uh, so, but I, if they did the patching, a, a decent do, uh, amount of patching, and they did a light overlay, I think it would last very well. Okay. Because it's last well so far, except with the exception of a couple places where mm -hmm. the water has been an issue as far as uh, mm -hmm. uh, taking out some of the street and stuff. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Yep. Yeah. I had one other question. Okay. So, is there any choice that we would make that would cause us to lose our ability to um, make choices in the future? I don't know, Ryan. I mean, because once we take you through this overlay, and are you thinking that in the future, what, 20 years from now, or well, what? It kind of sounded like if we chose the reconstruction, then we'd also um, lose our ability to make any um, importer choices going in the future. Ryan. I, I would argue that we're. it would change from the methodology of doing street improvements to going into the city's capital plan with every other street in town. Yeah. But for anything that do with curbs, sewer and water, that policy wouldn't change at all. <coughs> so if, if you wanted the 60-40 split now and then wanted to go back to petition later, we'd have to go back yeah. and rechange the policy. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please I just come forward. Question. And name and address for the record. Gary Schneller, 1500, 152nd yeah. Street. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm up on 152nd up there, yeah. and it looks like it's a possibility of just going to the tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the people on the other side of the tracks have no way out other than in front of my house. Are they getting charged the same amount? R They're the right. ones that are complaining about how rough our street is because the trucks and stuff go back there to build their houses. Okay. Ryan? That, that, that rest of it has sewer and water and curbs? That's right. Yes. So and you have sewer and water, right, Gary? No. No, you're on the other side. Yep, I'm yeah. on the poor side of the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is the reason our road is in such poor shape is because of all the dump trucks putting dirt in and taking sand out. Excuse me. It's like nobody can get together and meet in the middle. The, for certainly that would have a bearing, but I think the age of the pavement, it, it, it would have degraded yeah. uh, with or without the expansion of our, the, the new homes and the new street. So down I, I guess I'm thinking that everybody should share this, not just our little stretch where they're coming past our house. From statute mm -hmm. 429 that yeah. dictates how we can operate assessments that w it wasn't allowed. It's not based upon travels or vehicles. It's mm -hmm. based upon benefit to yeah. the It's lots. state law? 429? Well. It's a bad law as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. We've heard that before. <laughs> okay. We've I drive, heard that yeah. concern. I drive about mm -hmm. 200 feet to my house. Yeah. But beyond my house, I yeah. still have property <laughs> that I have to pay for that I never use. So I just, I just don't know if it's all fair. Okay. But. Well, we, that's why we're I having this just, conversation, and we'll just look at all yeah. of that. I mean, yeah. Because. Like I say, it's. It's the people to the west of me that uses the street that's causing the problem. Mm. But well, there are additional users. Of, I think you do I guess use I'll the have street. To put a stop arm out there or something. <laughs> <laughs> Charge yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's well, all I got. Thank you, Gary. Uh, yes, you had well, another thought. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more question. Okay, um, I thought there was a determination that the city had made a while back about the number of of uh, waste trucks that could go through your neighborhood and stuff? Put zones in so that uh, I don't know what day uh, that uh, the uh, trucks can come through. Do, do we know? Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. So Thursday. only Thursday. That's So we limited the number of trucks. So they're not going through your neighborhood every day of the week. But they can go on Thursday. And it depends on all of you. <laughs> 
You know, all of you may have different uh, haulers. So if you want to go together and say, we only want one hauler coming through our neighborhood, you guys do that. We don't dictate that to you. Heather? And Madam Mayor, there, there is a very um, good instructive process detailed on our website. So if you did want to get your neighbors together to do mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, one garbage yeah. provider, in your neighborhood yeah. that there's some neighborhoods it's very helpful that. to walk through that yeah there's, some there's neighborhoods have done that there's I, I realize that and there's one particular but there's one particular hauler that that drives by in front of my house four or five times on thursday and that's part of the reason why it's pounding up the road that's you know yeah, when they're well, driving we, by four or five yeah. times in one day i have no idea why that is and that's private um it's a private company and he's servicing some of your neighbors so I don't know. But maybe you all should get together and say we only want one holler to come through our neighborhood. But that's something you all do. We don't do that. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, come back and then I'll go I'll home. Go along with what uh, I've spoken to here. Are you going to be the oh. uh, the coordinator of the one holler? No, I'm Bob <laughs> Workman, 1304 <laughs> Circle Light, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, we've got... Buckingham, yeah. uh, Waste Management, yeah. Dix, Republic, Aspen, and Allied. Mm -hmm. And that's once a week. Mm -hmm. But on that second week, now we got 12 trucks that come through there. Recycling. Recycling. And I'm sure that has to do with the breakdown of the road mm -hmm. on that street. Then the best thing for all of you to do is get together and just hire yeah, one holler to come through. And we've tried that. You know, we sent uh, notes out to people to gather and stuff, but everybody wants to do their own thing. And, the, and you know what? We've gone through this process in the city three times, and everybody wants to do their own choices. So all we said is, everybody, there's, we divided up the city into zones, and the hollers were here. You can only go into that neighborhood on your designated day. Yeah. Uh, and we encourage neighborhoods to to go together and get one hauler coming through you know everybody wants the fair market value and they all want to make their own choices and we're not going to dictate to them well the thing about it is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> i understand there's garbage coming out of those trucks on doing uh, my yards I, just loaded all I, the time i know i you understand know. and yeah. Now, if I go down the road and I throw something out the window, I get a $200 fine. How about these guys? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. And I also wanted to speak to uh, the one-inch rise on the street level. I was, uh, we moved into our house in 76, okay? <laughs> and that was before they came to redo the street in, I think it was 98. But we did have asphalt down before that. Okay, so then they come and they read the street and they put curbs in those great asphalt curbs, mm -hmm. you know. And now if it goes up, oh, then when they come by, it was snow plows. I had a rise in my curb at least that high to begin with. Now it's like that. Yeah. It's about three inches because all that asphalt flies into the yard. Okay, <coughs> so now if they go up another inch, and I hope, I really do hope there's going to be some curb taken care of there. Because otherwise, my yard's going to be underwater again. Okay. And it was before they came to do the road second time, or the first time, that I got flooded out there. And I still do. Okay. Well, Because it's all downhill. We'll and take it, and John, you and your crew can take a look at that. And Dan, I don't know what yeah, to say to you. Yeah, we would definitely <laughs> want to make sure we get that curb back where it was before. Uh, yeah, I so hope it so. Should not create <laughs> yeah. new issues. Yeah. <laughs> well, we I've got it, a culvert yeah. under my driveway, yeah. and before they put the curb in there in the first place, <laughs> uh, I couldn't keep up with keeping the sand and whatever mm -hmm. else out of there. Okay. I couldn't do it. It was physically well, impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And all of our staff, who, who, whether it's snow removal, our superintendent who does that, he's, in, he's here. Everybody is hearing all of this. You had, yes, please. 
Carl Ward, P301 Elkano Lane. Okay. I'm kind of uh, with yeah. Dave, the yeah. one inch overlay. But I have a question is, do you think that's in the whole 28 years that that street's been there that that's appropriate that it's only been seal coated one time in that whole 28 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know, Ryan. I think one of the things is that uh, we, our uh, our uh, staff goes out and take a look at all of that, and you I know, called we them a number of times and told them when are we going to be on the list. Well, you're on the list two years from now. Two years after that, I called again. Well, no, we're not coming out there and doing it. Oh, so I if we put these improvement into these streets, is the city's going to maintain the streets any better? Like seal coating to, yeah. get, to the, extend the life of these streets. Okay, Ryan. Uh, currently, basically after resurfacing, you get there'd be one resurf uh, one seal coat after that, and then it would be time. We don't. We only can. I maybe five percent of the roads we can um, seal coat each year. Something around that percentage. So if it's in there thirty years, you only get seal coated one time. Um. The, currently, yep, that's correct. So the what we're doing on the rest of the streets in town is uh, attempting to. Repave the streets, seal coat, and then we go into a resurfacing. Uh, we just can't. Um, yeah. our, our budget for seal coating yeah. hasn't gone up, and the cost has. So we're focusing on the roads that are in better condition as opposed to those that have um, started yeah. to fail. But if you put a little bit more money into the seal coating out in this area, would it extend the life of the streets? Not past the 20 it years. It wouldn't. No. Okay. That's okay. all I got. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming in. And this process will continue. You'll all be notified. You all, our staff will also continue to work with you, whether that's a neighborhood <coughs> meeting again like they had, was it September? Uh, June. Of June of last year. Yeah. So we'll continue, and then uh, we'll, uh, when they have a suggestion after l hearing all of you to tonight, I hear that people want, uh, one, get those streets <coughs> reconstructed or rehabilitated, that uh, have been identified or seal code uh, the two inch uh, overlay. And so you all can check out the maps uh, and then staff, <coughs> the next time we'll have a discussion around this after you gather all of the information and have some answers. Um, I mean, we would like to have some discussion on a potential path forward if, if you're willing to do so. Well, I think the path forward is that we heard from uh, the residents that we need to continue to move along this process. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I think what, um, what Mr. Peterson is saying is, is, is continue along this process moving forward. And some of these questions aren't going to be able to be answered unless we have a path forward. And so, um, and I've heard most of the folks that came in here were, were supportive of the staff recommendation with respect to that, but, um, but, but we have to get that direction from council yeah. before we move forward and are able to answer What I questions. hear one is that how are they going to be assessed mm -hmm. and and one is what is uh the different lots so i think what we need to take a look at what is buildable and what isn't buildable and how we look at that i think the the direction that we would are, are hoping to get is do we want to move forward with one a or one b do, do we want to consider putting them into our capital plan and funding improvements without the petition. I think I heard them say the 40-60 split is what they're... they're, so uh, they're the, then <laughs> with, with that direction, then we can take it and move forward. And, that we, yeah. we, let's look at the because policy. Because they wanted to have, if I, if I hear correctly, have the same as mm -hmm. all of the other residents in the city of Burnsville with the 40-60 split. I see Dave looking at me and I'm... There's the roads that the roads that don't need to have it done. No, we're not we, going to do that. The, the roads that don't need resurfacing right now, we're not yeah. going to go after. But the ones yeah. that do, when we can save yeah. some of the payments, is what we would yeah. do then. So you can look at the map, and it tells you what that funding mechanism is, okay? And then we will still get a, a, a clear definition on on lots, what is buildable. Too. Yeah. So it's like we might be for 4060, but we don't know all the facts yet. So we, it's, it's not, not fair to ask us yet if we agree or not. No, no. All we're doing is that to give staff the direction to start down that road. We know what the others are. We know that if you don't want that, then 
My question is, is once we start down that path, is there any turning back if we don't like it? Ryan. One option that uh, 429 projects have, special assessment projects have, is you can go all the way through yeah. and get bids yeah. and have the, on yeah. the rest of our projects, we always do the assessment hearing at That's the right. end. There is a process of where you can do the assessment hearing yeah. before you award a contract. That's right. So you can get all the way to that point. Yeah. And, and we can and we can say no. And then the, that's right. And the city can also sit and go, okay, we got five objections and we don't want to take on the risk mm -hmm. of losing out on assessments. Yeah. So if you know, it could protect both the city and yeah. the residents. So that yeah. that could be one methodology yeah. we would use in this particular yeah. project was to go that route as opposed to our typical. Yeah, and that and that's a very reasonable route because it has a lot of public hearings. And when you don't want it, then you don't get it. And then we start the process on what you need, what you want down there in that area. One other comment is when you're looking at these contracts and things. Oh, Carol. Oh. One other comment is when, you, when you're starting to talk to the contractors and things like that, is there a possibility that you can talk to them about the consideration that for those of us that might want our driveways blacktop? Oh, yeah. That we could have that kind of, I don't know, maybe we'd like a really good deal. We, <laughs> Ryan. We strongly uh, try to avoid that. Yeah. Uh, but when what the, we ask you to do is when you're doing yours, you can, you can hire a contractor that would do your driveway. That hits ours, right? Yeah, if, yeah. If, if we make it part of the contract and then no. we have no, a driveway. No, we don't make it part of the contract. Other neighborhoods have had, had coordinated yep. with yep. our contract so that it's all yep. done at the same time. And sometimes right. contractors yeah. are so yeah. busy. I guess that's what I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, you can coordinate with your own private contractor. Yeah, but if they're already in the area, then. Mm, yeah, 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 kind of hard to do that. Yeah, and uh, street Not paving good. street paving contractors generally don't want to yeah, mess with driveways. Yeah, they They're don't want to have the risk of going onto your property. Okay. Exactly. All right. Yes. How about a, a rough estimate of show of hands who wants the sixty forty? Just for a rough guess. Who wants the sixty forty? Well, it depends on what. It, what well, well I mean, and then we'll get it through. We'll move it through. All the other yeah. Issues are met. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, That's a good idea. Looks like a whole lot of you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Huh? Uh, no, I was just going to say the sixty forty, and then we can figure out the rest. Yeah, we can the, figure out the rest. Along. Does that but give we know you the good, direction we're heading? Yeah. Do you, is that yes. good direction? Yes. Because I think right now yep. it just takes us all the way, and we can say no if you don't want to do it. Mayor, Mayor, thank you. I yeah. think that's the direction we need it. Is that we, good? We can say no as well if it yeah. uh, mm -hmm. doesn't work out for us. Yep. And we can start yeah. looking no, at there those is. lots and stuff. Kara, we go down this road, and then if everybody, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 All righty. Very good. Thank you. thank you so much. Yes. You had one more I question. One, I just want to know, is there, before this all gets done, is there, are the city going to, is the city going to patch the holes that are in there now? I'm going to have you talk with Ryan and John. Um, okay? I can I mean, we have yeah, holes yeah. In they, you can you can have that conversation with them. Okay. 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 I don't know if you had now or if oh, no. If everything just stops and through. Did you get coffee beforehand? Because I know we're way past your bedside. <laughs> I just texted you. <laughs> so you're okay? I am. <laughs> you texted Dan. I texted Dan. I because I know it's not like he's in bed okay. at seven. Okay. You don't want to hear about how we're going to shovel your sidewalks? <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants. Oh, wait a minute, they don't okay. have any sidewalks. <laughs> uh, welcome, Jeff and Dan. I think I'm going to go directly to you. Uh, Ryan is busy talking with others. And Jeff, are you going to uh, tee it up then? Uh, yeah, I was, we were going to originally let Ryan tee it up, but he's kind of busy. So, yeah, he's uh, kind of busy outside. I can yeah. I can tee it up. Okay, you uh, tee Ryan it up. Ryan and I just talked this morning. If you'd like me to tee it up, um, this is about the sidewalk snow plowing. We yeah. have been getting a lot more complaints. Can we okay. can we move the conversations outside, please? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now 
all teed up. Yeah. Met, mayor, <laughs> members of the council, um, we have been having sidewalk snow plowing plane oh, yes. complaints have yeah. seemed to increase over the years. And so we've been having some challenges related to we have had a, it contracted out, and the one contractor just flat out can't um, perform to our standards across the city. And so we have um, looked at some different options to explore. Um, that may be some combination of different things. And so um, we have our assistant public works director and our street superintendent here to talk about what some of those options might do. They are all rooted in the question of what service level you all want to provide, yeah. um, have provided for the residents. So with that, is that good? That is good. Okay. Um, I, Jeff Raddick, assistant public works director, I'll do the majority of talking. Dan will uh, break in here as I forget points or move too fast along. Yeah, you know, people were talking about snow or mobile tour. Right? <laughs> Dan I kept, off of I kept, I kept Street looking at you. S Street superintendent, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, why we're here tonight, uh, we've completed our most current uh, sidewalk snow plowing contract, so if we are going to make a change, this would be appropriate time to make a change. Uh, the level of service expectations are increasing. Um, mm -hmm. They have ever since we've uh, started contracting, and with the new ADA laws, uh, it's becoming much more apparent. Uh, yeah. When we first started this, we had no people that were, their primary mode was walking to a business every day. Or and using now we have their wheelchairs. Yes. County Road 5. So, we, we have several of those now, and that, w that wasn't something that was in the discussion when we originally started this mm -hmm. process. Uh, and we, we continue to struggle delivering the three-day level of service that is in, within our contract. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, just to go a little bit of history, uh, <coughs> pre-2008, the city contracted out some street uh, snow plowing and had gradually assumed sidewalk snow plowing with available city personnel. Quite often, like all, a lot of city surfaces are assumed at a point in time. In 2008, uh, we brought all street snow plowing in-house to provide a better level of service to that uh, to that program. I have to say that that has been a huge success. Uh, we pride ourselves that we provide some of the best snow plowing services in the metro um, with the caveat that we don't have 24 hour mm -hmm. staffing. Mm -hmm. But if you put up as, uh, us up against any other metro city, we think we do really good on, side, or on street snow plowing. Uh, then the dis history of this got into the 2009 budget reductions and at that time uh, staff reductions that left public works short of people to continue both the sidewalk snow plowing and the street snow plowing uh, so in solution to the budget uh, staff decided that it'd be best we contract out sidewalk snow plowing uh, for a number of reasons it, it would free our our personnel up to tackle streets um, if we contracted sidewalk snow plowing, it would be easily transferable to a fee-based system uh, for that. And also at that time, to save more budget, we uh, removed the future replacement of sidewalk snow plowing machines within the, cap or within the equipment fund. Um, hindsight being 2020, that probably wasn't good. Uh, that left us without the, our ability to uh, back up our own contractors. So 2009 to 2012 is uh, really when we when we started uh, contracting this out. Uh, we provided a minimal level of service. Uh, contractor had late model equipment. They even bought some of our old equipment um, when we got rid of it. Uh, they have frequent breakdowns, still have frequent breakdowns. Uh, they do a lot of field fixes to get up and running and they break again. Uh, they don't have the they don't have the mechanic mechanics on staff that we do. Uh, you, you guys all see the, the broken down piece of equipment on the side of the roads. Yep. Um, so it, it does happen. When, we're not going to say it doesn't, but uh, quite often there's last several days till they get, get it taken care of. Uh, also, we know they have minimal or no employee training. Uh, they have high employee turnover. When, when Dan calls them up, he doesn't know who he's going to get. Uh, he doesn't know if it, he's going to get a kid who has never plowed before or what level of person he's going to get when or they someone, show up. 
or someone that don't understand the mapping or getting in front of our priorities, you know, our, our, our schools or whether it's Nicollet or the heart of the city or, or whether it's, you know, down by the hospital. So setting priorities is a, a huge thing and you never know which individual you're going to get. Um, it's very difficult. They go through a lot of personnel and not all personnel go through, go through the, the level of training of, of like uh, what we put them through and expectations and that type of stuff for performance measures. Thank you. Um, in 2012, we came to you and we basically asked, can we help the contractor out with some yeah. of our equipment? And after our street sidewalks or, or our street plowing is done, can we help on sidewalks? And you agreed to that. Um, and we also did some other other things to hopefully get the contractor buy-in. Uh, we did longer term contracts and more comprehensive yeah. contracts, trying to flush this out uh, as a service that they'd like to provide um, and better than they have. Um, really that, that investment that we thought those contracts were gonna do has not happened. Uh, we're still getting about the about the same level of service that we did. Uh, our intention was in 2012 that if we do, when we do these three-year contracts that that would give uh, the contractor the ability to go invest in better equipment that we'd have less of the breakdowns and we'd be able to get through more of, uh, you know, meet those performance measures. Uh, it was very, very apparent um, that we didn't see. So, so the city uh, uh, street department is still running older equipment, but we're getting out there when streets are complete. And what uh, this picture here uh, basically shows that the contractor went through, our contractor went through, and you see there's still about two and a half inches of snow yep. because they, they didn't understand the adjustment uh, on a machine or they had an individual that didn't understand the adjustment. Or, or management that wasn't paying attention to to get to her one. So this picture here is one of our guys going through and, and we'd be that second or third day re-scraping everything and widening out and, 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 and trying to have a better product and, or better service in the end. Okay. And at this time, we also started to re, uh, refund one of our pieces of equipment. Uh, so that is gonna be replaced in the future. Um, then we're getting the Options we had we had four options for you we'd like to discuss tonight, of uh, and there as Heather said they all revolve around the level of service that you guys would like to see. I can tell you from the calls Dan and I receive, uh, they give us about 24 hours grace period. Well, um, I get and those then the, emails and phone calls. Yeah, and too, then the emails I... and phone calls start rolling in. Yeah. Um, so really, if we want to change, we have to hit that one to two day level that one day level of service on school routes and transportation mm -hmm. routes. And then second day lower priority routes is probably what we're targeting. So, so this uh, option one is delivery with all city forces. Uh, um, level of service, this will provide that one day level of service for uh, sidewalks and school zones and transportation routes. And second day uh, with everything else. I did the pictures up there so you kind of get a sense of uh, the equipment. The, the well, the, the operation that this would be. Um, as we go into the other options, you're going to see the operation gets larger to account for the slower start uh, on, and trying to make up the difference in time. So, this option, this would start immediately after the snow has stopped, and we provide one day level of service after the snow has stopped for school zones and second day level of service for everything else. And that, that of course would be based on, um, we, we based that on a six inch snowfall or less, just so you know, when we, we hit these peaks of 13 inch snows, um, all cities are, you're gonna add additional days to get that, that amount of material removed. Um, you face a lot of challenges with county roads and main roads that you scrape several times during the snowfall in, in that type of performance. Uh, this, I guess, this probably has the largest startup cost, and that's the, the capital number that I'm, I have there. It's 405,000. That basically gets you two new articulating sidewalk tractors, and it replaces an existing tractor with a blower combination. We think this can be done on a number of levels. Uh, there is fund balance available in both the sidewalk snow plowing fund and the general fund uh, 
that we could prov- we could uh, get this equipment and not have to bond for it or do anything like that. And then in the yearly fee, in the operating 195000 we are paying that equipment back uh, so we don't have this continual problem not have not having equipment. Nowadays, we don't buy equipment or hard, hardly ever buy equipment without thinking the replacement of the equipment. So in the, all, all these operating costs are the, the future replacement of this equipment and, and purchasing it back. So, uh, and also in operating is additional staffing. We'll get to uh, see a little staffing slide a little bit later. Uh, but all, all these uh, options, almost all of them involve some level of staffing. Uh, we worked out the numbers in one way, uh, but we are flexible and we want to do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, so I don't think the staffing has been fully fl- flushed out yet okay. on what the staffing looks like. Okay. Dan has a... When you get down to the fees here, is that ba- how's that based on how many times you plow a year? Or? So, uh, well, this is this is the fee that is in the sidewalk snow plowing yeah. fund. Right. Yeah. Um, so the fund kind of self... Uh, self funds itself on years that we have a lot of snowfall uh we have fund balance that we can dip into in years that we have a lot of and average how many times a year do you actually plow the sidewalks of well residential what what do you want to determine on average i'm looking at at your residential fees at 1665 per year to plow someone's sidewalk in front of their house i would say that pretty good deal yeah. <laughs> yes. In, I, I would in, gladly pay someone sixteen sixty five to take care of my front of my house. And, and this year we probably did. Um, I'm thinking probably thirteen times we've done walks or fourteen times complete walks. Um, wow. Just so, so you're aware, yeah, a little, yeah. little over a dollar a time per. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. It's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ryan. Maybe I can help explain it this way: is um, our lower years caught that were in a forty to fifty thousand dollar for the entire year yeah, that was maybe I gone up five that. or six times a year and we've been up to as much as around 150,000 yeah. so therefore and this budget is right in the middle of that so yeah. it's not budgeting for the peak but it's also not budgeting for the small it's mm-hmm. um but for this year we've spent almost the entire 2018 <coughs> um sidewalk snow plowing budget at, at this point well, so how much additional work does that give us doing residentials as far as time consuming, I mean, I remember when we didn't do residential, we just we did our right of ways and our commercial areas and that sort of thing. But we added residential back in what 2008. Yeah, no, we, we, when we did this, it was residential, and but the priority was schools, hospital, and all of those high service I don't think areas. We had residential early in the early 2000s. We added that in. Mary Sherry brought that to us and. That got added in when we started doing the people's sidewalks for their homes. Actually, this was yeah. built in 2008, yeah. um, so and I did actually bring a, a, did a, prior, yeah. a priority yeah. of of what what was determined back at that That's point we, in 2012. Yeah. Okay. And and I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm not mm-hmm. even sure where the camera is. So, right. um, That's fine. but if you wanted to take a look at that, um, the reds would be what we consider our priorities. Um, and stuff that goes by the schools, um, yeah. you know, some of the stuff goes by the hospitals, but that was that's what we determined at that yeah. point with Steve Albrecht back in yeah. 2012 yeah. was that we wanted to maintain that same priority yeah. at that time. We have so many people taking mass transit these days in the city. I see them at the bus stops all over the place. And well, and they're half walking. the time they're standing in the street waiting for the bus now because the sidewalks aren't done and the mm-hmm. bus stops aren't cleaned out yet. And yeah. So yeah. Um, I think when it was developed in 2008, we ten, we kind of took a sense of what we were doing at that time and tried to formulate uh, the plan. So I think we've been doing that probably since 2008. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, mm-hmm. right. that's um, the fees is based on no additional uh, general fund contribution. So $195,000 would be 215% increase. That sounds like a huge number. We admit it's a huge number, but when you look at it broken yeah. up into the fee basis on yeah. a residential basis, you're, you're at about $36 a year uh, yeah. to take care of your sidewalk. Mm-hmm. And commercial, it would be at about $0.40 cents per foot. Yeah. So if a commercial business had a 200-foot sidewalk in front of their house, we take care of that 200-foot sidewalk for $80 a year. 
uh, give you a little yeah. s- little sense of perspective. The bobcat that they hire for their parking lot is probably going $120 an hour. Um, mm-hmm. We can, we take care of their whole sidewalk for $80 a year. Yeah. And currently the general fund does contribute. Um, dam plows, uh, other general fund things happen that are contributed to sidewalk snow plowing. We think that's approximately 15 to 20% that we're already investing, uh, just to, just casual basis. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, uh, like the trails, it works better for us if we plow the trails before the streets are done. Then we can plow through and then the big trucks can wrap the corners and take care of all of that. Uh, so it works better for our, our operations that we do those first. Okay. So. Answer me this, because sometimes when you, you have a plow coming down and it's going and you have all of the snow coming over and it's spilling over to the sidewalk, is that still okay? When you're plowing mains or when you're actually plowing the walk? When you're plowing the, the main streets and then, they, and then you've got this big... You're going to have that whenever you're benching um, or or clearing mains and stuff, to, especially with the amount of snow we've received this year. You know, we're up in at 60-some, so it, it's a lot worse this year that that walks, and then you got to remove that from there. Or or say you do a, our collector several times during an event. What we do is we try to send those, those um, blowers out. I, I give them about two hours after our big trucks start. That's what takes us to get off the collectors, and then that's when I start our school zones and that type of yeah, stuff. Because when I go to the Y, I get mm-hmm. all these people who say, well, I couldn't run because the, I, it was impassable, or I couldn't walk, so I had to drive my car, or they walk through the snow and they complain. So, But you're saying that it's best to do those sidewalks then at the same time you're doing the streets? Well, there really wouldn't be a huge change in that because we're going to start whatever option you you determine. There there just would be no sense of starting walks at the same time as big trucks because you'd be filling everything you you just started with. And keep in mind, we have 135 miles of walks, so we have to start somewhere and we have to finish somewhere. Yeah, and that's um, what I tell people. It's 135 miles of, of uh, sidewalks, zones. and then we have 327 miles of streets, right? Something two, like that. 227. How much? 225. 225. 225. Oh, I'm counting in the county stuff. Somewhere not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you 225, that's ours. Mm-hmm. Okay. And quite often, um, when we do get those large banks, we're, we're putting snowblowers on our equipment to move that stuff back. Um, it's just a necessity that, unfortunately, we do barrier walks. One thing we have do get to tell residents is it's not your responsibility. It's our responsibility to move that large bank of snow. Um, so we will do it. Okay. Just can you go back to that side real quick? Just Does everyone understand what we're talking about with the um, startup cost of um, $405,000? That would just be out of budget reserve, wouldn't? It would affect how yeah. much money we have, but not the budget yeah. um, number. And then the 195 is annual. It's on a yearly basis. Okay. Yeah. And First so I wish. think that's it because uh, Councilmember um, Keeley uh, wanted to, uh, you know, for what, and, and I think he's watching. Uh, staff recommended, coupled with the economic recovery and demand for better quality service, he appears to support bringing this back. It appears that we're asking to bring the service back into the city, but he, his question was, are we um, giving back everything that we have saved? But what I'm hearing you say is that we're not. We're using some of the savings, but we're still, with the increase in the in the rate, we'll still cover this level of service. You, yeah, that, that'd be one thing we'd have to figure out. Do we want to cover it all with rates, or do we want to have some general fund um, allocation to this? Uh, because there's lots of city parcels that um, yeah, the that road we, that the yeah. sidewalk is in front of. So otherwise, you're making the people who ha- who are the only people who would be paying for the uh, sidewalks where it's in front of a public piece of land are the other folks who have a sidewalk. So yeah, well, we still have to have a contribution because those yes. there's a lot of s- footage. In front of all of our parks. Exactly. And and that's where people run. And you and Heather, we had all of those, the people down in 
in Crystal Lake area who wanted all of that stuff plowed, mm. all those yeah. t trails plowed. You had a uh, Madam Mayor, the, the, the recommendation in front of you is is to fund it with the sidewalk snow plowing yeah. fee. That was what folks had moved yeah. toward, and so that um, so that would mean that we would take it out of <coughs> the fund balance in the sidewalk snow plowing fund yeah. and not not touch the general fund. That's so, right. Um, so that's kind of I think what we were talking about. Yeah, in but terms of doing the it, general so. fund is our portion. We could take a portion of it from that to represent the, yeah. the city portion. Sure, that's how I see it. it it's only fair. Mm -hmm. That's it's the public's. Yeah. It's a public's asset, and all of that in a front we should be paying for. Correct. Yeah. Um, if Carol. we're going to start dipping into the general fund in a way that we are presently not doing because we're contracting it out, I start to have a problem with it. But I think we were paying for our portion, if I remember correctly, Heather. Uh, Ma Madam Mayor, Council Member Schultz, that sort of dipping into the general fund that you're referring to would be for the equipment purchase piece, not necessarily, I mean, the operating piece, we'd have to f determine right now we are mm -hmm. already funding a portion of the operations through the general fund, and so that would not necessarily be um, where we would be dipping in on an ongoing basis. It would be the sort of one time, is my understanding. Okay. So in the ongoing, we would not be increasing an amount that we're taking out of the general fund. We would have to refine the estimates that we have to confirm that. But I think that right now, we're dipping into the general fund on an ongoing basis to supplement the, the current contractors. Right, and because so the current contract is we're, we're trying to get it done. And then it's not getting done, so then we have to go back and do and it. Do it. Mm -hmm. So we're paying twice, basically. Correct. Correct. I mean, it's a good year. Yes. So we're, each, we're paying to get it done right. Each year there's an allocation from the general fund that goes yeah. to the sidewalk snow plowing yeah. fund. All of, everything you're going to see here tonight has an increase in cost. Yeah. So if we wanted to continue at the same percentage of cost sharing between general fund and fees, there's going to have to be an increase well, in, um, in general fund allocation. Yeah. Otherwise, the people paying for the difference are the folks who have sidewalk in front mm -hmm. of them, and then they're paying for everyone else's. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not fair. <coughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Not good at this. And when you do look at the 195,000, uh, that is total cost. Uh, yeah. Currently, the the system runs at about $91,000 yeah. uh, in fees. So when you're looking at $195,000, 104 of that would be new. Yeah, yeah. And that comes from the increase in in fees. Yes. In direct fees. Yeah, we'd proportion that out. Yeah. Yep. And you proportion it out on the two day le level of service. Yep. Okay. Because, sure. hey, I don't like to get all the emails that I get on this, so we need to have those two-day level of service. Yep. So uh, the pros with option one is definitely that two-day level of service, and as we, that's kind of what we hear uh, when we do take complaints. Yeah. Is we got to be within that two-day level of service. Um, it's we. There's no profit motive in in public works, uh, but we try to do operations as efficiently as possible and we feel it's our job to get you guys yep. the best level of service at the lowest price mm -hmm. uh, so it's it would be a very efficient operation you'll see the other operations are a little bit less efficient and more involved um, yeah. so one of the other pros is this would be full city control and we'd be fully accountable for it uh, we we would love that um, uh, take the contractor out. Let uh, our public employees serve the public. Yeah. Um, that that is what we're here for. A lot of our, almost all of our employees get that. Uh, that we're providing service mm -hmm. uh, to people, and uh, when you get the contractor involved, in between it, uh, it mutes that a little bit. So, okay. we can have those management conversations with our employees about serving the public uh, that we can't have with contractors. So cons, uh, as you've seen, the high startup costs, uh, we have to get back in the equipment game to be able to do this. Uh, this is the highest, highest yearly cost. And as Ryan pointed out, our 2018 budget is already 
spent. Uh, so we're going to be dipping into the sidewalk snow plowing reserve okay. uh, to pay for the rest of 2018, which is two two months basically. Yeah. Oh. Two months still forecasting snow. <laughs> so. We we might have an event Saturday. Yes, <laughs> we <have a> <laughs> saw that. <laughs> Uh, option two is contracting with additional city support. Um, this would get the contractors out on first priority routes on that first day. Uh, but something we have to understand is all, even if we contract out all the pieces of equipment that have a function and anybody who wants to be working in snow removal is probably working on those large events. Um, so you have to pay more to get better contractors in and the better pieces of equipment in. So you're, fight, you're fighting an uphill battle if you don't have it. Uh, so contracting, we're still gonna be at, the, at that two day on those uh, school, school zones unless we significantly do something different with contracting. And I, I just don't think, you can't buy those pieces of equipment out of Burnsville Center or something. Those guys are tied in with really large contracts. Dan? In your experience, do you feel you've had any good uh Good luck with contracting it out. Uh, in the beginning, when we were just yeah. providing the minimal level of service, um, there wasn't the complaints. Um, the dynamic has that changed. That was only one for, year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the expectation for the level of service has significantly changed yeah. since we started contracting it. So Yeah, Kara. So why do you think that there was less complaints even though it was minimal service? I think it was probably the economic times uh, that people were realizing. They would, they would put up with a lower level of service to understand uh, that it wasn't hitting them on the tax base. I, I think that argument has probably gone away. So. I know the recession just kicked in and we were really, yeah, everything was collapsing quickly. And everything else, uh, so this is, this would be the same uh, what we do now. Uh, the contractor goes out that first day. After we are done sidewalk or street snow plowing, uh, we put our guys and our pieces of equipment and help them out the second and third day. Um, so this one, so really when our services kick in, it'll be that second day, and then we clean it up in two days after that. Uh, but you still, we're still going to be dealing with uh, complaints in those school zones on the transportation routes. Those bus stops are not gonna get pushed back until the second day. Uh, funding for this, uh, $75,000 uh, to replace the tractor with the blower combination. Um, we'll, get to, we'll get to understanding that a little bit when we uh, go farther down the list here. Um, we'd put the contract together with uh, a projected increase for performance measures. Um, there's argument that you can't charge them, you can't charge them disincentive without char allowing them incentive. Uh, so if we put that in the contract, the contract's gonna significantly go up um, to try to get that better level of service. Uh, here we also, new and existing uh, equipment operations and staffing. Uh, funding for this is about a 192% increase uh, and you can see the the, it would go up for, from uh, 1665 to 32. We're saving a couple dollars a year uh, with this option, basically. And the general fund contribution, we still, we still uh, leave it at about 15 to 20 percent of the operation. Maybe to help, just make sure yeah. you understand the um, 100. Why it's so much more is Dan's told me the going rate on renting this type of equipment is about $140 an hour. Mm -hmm. The last contract we got was around $80 an hour. Mm -hmm. And our service shows because of that. So if, if we're going to demand they get done in two days, mm -hmm. then we're going, there, we're going to see a significant increase. And that's the primary reason why the number has gone up that dramatically, Thank along you. with the one piece of equipment where we would be expanding. So just so you're aware. So we're currently paying about 85 when we get to some more slides farther along here. We're currently paying about $84 an hour, I believe it is, for the contractor and their equipment. Uh, typical contractors 
um, because uh, we've had to reach out on, on 42 to a different contractor and, 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 and had some help with it. Uh, typical, when I checked around numbers and I checked several places, you're looking anywhere from a $130 an hour with a rubber tired skid, that means tires, up to uh, $150 an hour um, with a track machine. Um, with blower. That's the current rate that's that's out there. And them are the type of numbers that when we do bid this out, or, or if we were to bid this out, that we're going to see numbers that are going to reflect a lot closer to that than what we currently are seeing right now. Uh, in 2015, we did, the, we did a three-year bid, and we almost saw a 20% increase. So we're expecting at least a 20% increase, plus uh, all the performance measures that we put in the contract. Uh, pros, uh, this does have lower startup costs uh, than the option one. It, it's going to provide a le better level of service than we currently do, uh, but we are not going to get to that one-day level of service on school zones. Um, I want to make that perfectly clear. We're, we're just not going to make school zones in one day. Um, some other cons, uh, you're very close to option one. Um, uh, so just 11% more and you got option one. And also in both of these options two and three, uh, we are pushing the market of what contractors can do for us. Uh, we have tried to make the market work uh, for us since about 2012. Um, and I, I guess nobody takes snow plowing like we take snow plowing. We take it very seriously and uh, it is our business. It's one of our, one of our core functions. Um, so we, it also gets to be a little bit unfair for our employees. We push our employees to make up for what the contractor uh, hasn't done for us. So, and this also gets to be a very, when you talk incentive and disincentive contracts, it gets to be very complicated. And uh, do we want Dan spending time in the office figuring out if, the, if they got a 5% increase or a 5% decrease, or do we want to be handling complaints that we get? Um, with that time. Option uh, three, uh, level of service. So this is basically what we are doing now. We would shore up the contract, what we are doing now, and uh, um, basically provide the, the same level of service. It's that two, two day in school zones and three and four days and everything else. Uh, the, the big difference between this and option two is the skid steers on the right. In option one and two, we had a large buying a larger piece of equipment. Uh, in this option, uh, we are using existing equipment. Uh, the existing equipment, you put a skid steer on a, a, a trail, it's going to make one, two miles an hour. Uh, we put the tractor with the blower on the trail, it's going to make five miles an hour. Uh, so that's basically the, the differences between here. But then we wouldn't have that, equ that equipment cost. And quite often we do. We do to use uh, uh, skid, skid steers several times a year to break open our trails. This, there's nothing we can do about it. All, a lot of those trails are on county roads and you see them, they get pushed back five times during the snow event and they're, they're pretty much buried. So it takes us a long time to dig those out. That's why you're seeing that four day level of service. Operating is, we figure it's about $135,000 a year. Uh, there's really, this is just basically the contract as we expect it uh, to come back, and we're also going to be funding our current equipment and just re reclassifying some seasonal staff. Um, so this is basically what we are doing now. Option three is what we're doing now. We still expect it to be almost 150% increase uh, simply to get that contractor to commit uh, to those pieces of equipment in those days. Um, and the residential unit rate's gonna go up from about 16, 65 to about $25 a year. Uh, and this, because it's a smaller contract, uh, we probably are currently putting more into this percentage-wise from the general fund than any other option. So. Uh, pros, there's no startup cost. Uh, we anticipate a slightly improved quality from the contractor. Anytime you put incentive in a contract, they're going to go for the incentive. 
Uh, so we do expect a little bit better quality of service. Uh, you still, still on the con side, you're still only providing a four day level of service. It is an inefficient operation. Uh, basically, the contractor's going day one, we're showing up day two or three to help them out. Uh, and it has the same, uh, other same cons as option two. Uh, option four, this is uh, something that was kind of brought to staff, uh, partial residential sidewalks, no removal. Um, this would be the city going back to just plowing uh, uh, sidewalks adjacent to city parcels. It gets a little complicated and we'll try to explain it uh, as best we can. And this, I can't say, this, this uh, it depends what you want for level of service at this point. Uh, if you want one day level of service, this is gonna be the most expensive. Um, that's currently what the ordinance has for residents is 24 hours to clear their sidewalk. Since we do it, we don't enforce it. Um, but if we were gonna enforce that uh, for residents, we think we probably have to do it ourselves. Uh, so it's gonna be very expensive to get it all done in one Once day. Once you do something and you take it away, they're not gonna like it. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of shot for that middle zone, a level of service, just to give you some sense of numbers. Um, to get, and just to get you, there's, we'd be turning back sidewalk snow plowing on about 4,000 parcels that we currently do it for. Uh, so in that two to three day operation, we think it's about $115,000 plus or minus a year. It all depends what you want to do for a level of service here. Uh, it gets complicated. Uh, as you can see on the right, we did an analysis of what we have. And the problem with uh, sidewalk snow plowing is you basically have to get on at an intersection and you have to get off at an intersection. So there's a lot of parcels in between that are going to get free service simply because how we have to run the operation. Um, yeah, all of this goes back into the property tax is what yeah. you're telling us. Yeah, so yeah, this... you. If we're if we go back to this, we there is no fee anymore. Yeah. Uh, we have to we have to turn it back to property tax level, yep. um, and this has the largest impact on property taxes. Mm -hmm. One hundred fifteen thousand dollars would have to go back onto the property tax. Just to be clear, why that cost is still there is over fifty percent. We can't expect someone to clear snow from a ten foot wide trail. Yeah, that's too much. So we still have to clear all the trails. And then we have to clear snow away from every parcel that has footage in front of a city parcel, mm -hmm. MnDOT, yeah. uh, Dakota County land. So, more if we tried to do this, we'd have we'd still be plowing more than half the sidewalks and trails. Yeah. So and that also explains. also be in front of all of the residents. We're not going to be doing that, but they're not going to be doing it, and we'll still get the complaints. And we get to bring in Mr. Forslund's uh, part of the operation. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of cons. Uh, obviously, this has no startup costs. Uh, level of service is kind of unknown, uh, what you'd want to provide. Um, we're shifting a lot of responsibility to residents. As you said, they're going to probably fight back about it. Uh, it's an inefficient and complicated operation. Um, it, I, we'll get to exp explaining it. And I kind of did the 24-hour city code thing. Uh, and like you said, this the correction measure is the Chris Forslin department for this. And he's not going to like that. <laughs> no, he, he's not. Uh, Dan and I like to say, like if you want to talk like about that. snow plowing, call Public Works. Uh, don't don't bring Chris Forslin involved. Mm, so. They're sending emails yeah. to me. So. I'm sending it back all over to you guys, and I'm sure that they get it too. But you, you know, yeah. That's this year want. was That's a want. lot. Yeah. And, and that it's the service we provide. It's what we like doing. Um, Dan probably gets a headache every time after a snow event, but it, it's our business. Uh, if you have an issue with that, any snow plowing, give Public Works a call. Um, so this is trying to explain. This is County Road 11, just north of Burnsville Parkway. Mm -hmm. This is kind of trying to explain how complicated it is. On the east side of the road, which would be the right side of the picture, um, you have a 10-foot wide trail. So we'd be providing that with uh, with general fund 
uh, because it's larger than we did expect mm -hmm. a resident to do. On the west side, uh, which would be the left-hand side of your portion, is a five-foot sidewalk. Uh, yeah, so the yellow first, and red. The red yep. is is residential. So residential. red would be residential that we are skipping. Yeah. Yellow would be uh, adjacent to a city parcel, which we are doing. Please. Uh, Even the mowing, I uh, get complaints. Why is it that we mow part of it and we don't mow the other side of the uh, of the boulevard that's in the front of their yard? Yes, uh, the, that's what this And that's what this is going to, uh, yeah. again, create. You're 100% correct. Uh, I said we get to staffing. Uh, we currently have 45 maintenance workers. We work on a minimum staffing level of 35. Uh, you don't think in, a, in any given day, on, in a weekday, 35 is not a problem. W but we work on a staffing level seven days a week. So sometimes getting to 35 employees on a weekend is difficult. Um, a full street snow, plow, snow plowing uh, call out is 28 people, 28 maintenance workers. And then usually anything under six inch event, we try to maintain normal operations. That is uh, producing water, putting in the water towers. That is fixing uh, fire trucks that are broken down. That is getting ice rinks cleared uh, so they can, they can function. So anything under six inches event, we try to maintain our normal, normal day operations. And that is anywhere from 10 to 12 employees, uh, mostly depending on what's in the shop. I can't send a seasonal employee to work on a fire truck, um, so we have to take those people out of out of the snow plowing operation. Uh, and then we get to it. So our current level of service for sidewalks on the first day of a snow event would be minus four. Um, we can backfill that with some seasonal employees, but that's why all these options have some additional staffing involved, um, is because we are currently running that thin. Uh, so we did do a market rate comparison and see what all the other cities are are doing. Uh, we did, I think, you know, we did uh, manufacture the fee process in 2009 uh, simply to get around what, what the budget impacts were. Uh, but we, we kind of went back to everybody and kind of saw what they were doing. Uh, we are maintaining the higher, the the higher number of miles of sidewalks and trails. Only person that's, or only say that's larger than us is Apple Valley. Uh, they are maintaining more. And you can see they're all, uh, all of them except Egan are doing this with city forces. Um, uh, Egan, Edina, sorry, Edina is making uh, some residents uh, responsible for, for clearing some of their own sidewalks. Edina also assesses them 100%. Yeah. on their street recon. So, and then you can see in the far right uh, level of service uh, that everybody is providing. Um, mostly everybody's in that one to two day. Uh, Minnetonka is at three days, we're at four days. But everybody else is, uh, is in that one to two day. And they're all funding this out of a, a property tax. So. So as you, as you think of options to consider um, and what you guys would support, uh, sorry, what you would support, um, you can look at these numbers. Uh, obviously, option one is the preferred option from staff. Um, it puts us in full control and also puts us in full accountability for our sidewalk snow plowing. Um, and you have to look at the, when you do look at these operating numbers, yeah, we already have $91,000 that we're collecting in fees. Uh, so fees will go up, um, but when you break that out, it's not a lot per year, so. Okay. So we're just looking for input on yeah. that. Yeah, Dan. Um, I, you know me, Ryan, I've been talking about this for years. I think option one is the right way to go. We gotta get the sidewalks clear so people can get to work. So they can go shopping, so they can go to school, go to school, all those things. And right now, it's not happening for our residents. I, I seriously, I see people in wheelchairs on Conroe Road Five trying to go up to Cub the shop, 
I see people at the bus stop standing on the, bu on the Burnsville Parkway, on the parkway waiting for buses because it's all full of snow in there and they just can't, can't get to it. It's, uh, it doesn't make, it's not a good atmosphere during these, after these snowstorms and these people sit there for two days doing that or three days mm -hmm. trying to get that done. I think it's, it's we, we really work hard. I, I think we're one of the best cities on the streets in the metro area. I lived in Minneapolis for a long time and I'd be waiting four days for my street to get done sometimes. So we do a great job on that. We have to, I think we still have to have the same priority on our sidewalks as well because we have so many people taking mass transit these days and so many people are on their feet these days walking around and we've got to take care of that asset. Kara? You mentioned on option four that there would need to be an increase in property tax. What mm -hmm. would be the difference in increase in property tax versus the elimination of the fee? Essentially, um, all $105,000. So right now, we collect around $90,000 a year in, in in the fee. Or is it eighty? About $83,000. $83,000 a year in the fee. We wouldn't be able to collect any. So then we would have the entire $105,000 would be out of property tax. And we wouldn't be doing the full maintenance that uh, we were doing before. If we, I, I saw your Correct. your uh, diagram, that means the property owners would have to take care of theirs. Yeah, we'd be turning almost care. half back That's over right. to the property owners. Yeah. So, so yeah, if, if you uh, looked at option one, this is what you asked, but if you looked at option one, if we increase the fee we, and increase the um, general fund allocation the same percentage, it would be approximately at twenty-five to $35,000 a year was what we'd be need for the general fund to... Yeah. take on the city's um, frontage the city's and the trails. Yeah. Of all of our assets. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, 30, 35 cents, uh, $35 per year for a residential. And then um, what was it per foot for uh, business? It's currently about 19 cents a foot, and yeah. then option one would be 40 cents a foot. 40 cents a foot, and you calculate that to about $80 a, a, a year. Yeah. Yeah. Kara. Question. So each one of these options, uh, except for the last one, there's not only going to be an increase in the fee to residents, but there's going to be a corresponding increase in property tax because we can't just magically mm -hmm. have more general fund. I would agree with that. So yeah, uh, all of these well. options include increasing property tax. To, to a point, yes. Uh, Currently, we think there's about $31,000 that happens uh, from the general fund into the sidewalk snow plowing fee. So if the sidewalk snow plowing fee goes up 200%, we'd have to, the general fund would have to go up to 60000 or 62000 uh, as well. So there, there is going to be a slight uh, property tax increase. If you want to keep the ratio of fee and general property tax the same. If you don't and we increased it and all in the fee, then the only people paying for that other increase are the people who have sidewalks or trails in front of their yeah. house. So Heather, on uh, when we look at the budget and you're looking at the levy, will you have a line item, just like we have the Emerald Ash bore, will you have a line item that says uh, $36,000 uh, more? Madam Mayor, we can, we can certainly do that, we, but we do need to make sure we're refining the estimates too, since well, we are doing some, the reason why, yeah. we're doing some cross, or we're doing some subsidizing of the operations currently. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're only yeah. increasing the property tent tax to the extent that we're not subsidying it now, if that makes sense. Yeah, so. and I think that there's a lot of that work that will come before us when we get into the budget. Yeah, yes. we didn't want to do that level of work when we were doing four options. Yeah. So we like to get down to get one or two options before we start doing that level of work. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at level of service. Okay. Yeah, Kara. Would there be a way to... And I, and I do understand that, that presently we only do fees for people that have sidewalks in front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but we do have these other sidewalks and trails and all that kind of stuff that we do that is a general. It's part of the public. Part of everyone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, does that need to be done through property tax or can that be placed through fee? Everyone gets a fee. 
Uh, perhaps street lighting would be a great example of that exact situation. On your utility bill, you have two street lighting fees if you mm -hmm. have continuous street lighting. You have intersection lighting that pays for all the mm -hmm. intersection lights in town. And then there's a separate fee for continuous street lighting. So, so some parcels have two street lighting fees yes. if there is continuous street lighting in your neighborhood. Yeah. And others just have one that pays for all the intersection lighting. That might be something staff can look at, Kara. Yeah, I have a, I have a real... And I realize some of this is, is a shell game. I get that. Um, but I, I do not like, I mean, we're doing this, and then we're going to be heading into budgeting. And, and I know it's going to be, again, hey, let's raise property tax. And I am just done with that. So I, I would like to have options on that if, if possible. And I think a fee is a lot more transparent. Okay. To people let, let on me, this. Then let me ask you, are you li liking the option one where it comes back to us and we provide the level of service that our citizens is looking for in uh, one to two, two days, which is what our, our neighbors are all doing? And because part of what I receive from our is that, you know, when I go to Egan or I go to Lakeville, I can run. Mm -hmm. Or I can do that. I can't do that in Burnsville on the second day uh, of a snow event. So, <coughs> I mean, when we look at our cities, for me, when I look at it, and I agree with Dan, for me, it's the level of service that I hear from people that they want. What I don't want is I don't want us double paying. I, I don't like what we're doing right now, which is yeah. we're, we're paying twice. So I don't, I don't like that. So, you know, either it has to be somewhat fixed with the contractor which you gentlemen are saying, that's just a non-starter. Like, that's that's really not going to happen it's well, not in this market, correct? It's not going to be It's just not as effective. It's not. Um, or we can bring it in-house, and then we're doing it. Um, you know, and truthfully, I'm grappling with this a little bit because this is the very first place I have ever lived that residential sidewalks are not the responsibility of the resident. Like, that is... So... Um, but I also realize on that option four, when you're looking at it, you're saying basically we would remove the service and charge you more. On the general fund, yeah. The general, mm -hmm. the general fund. Yeah. Yep. The fee would go away. Which is also kind of an amazing, wild, wonderful thing. Um, well, because all we'd be doing at that point is city parcels. I know, so yeah. We'd have to mm -hmm. spread it to everybody. Yeah, no, and I, and I get that. I get that. Um, I, I mean, I think, truly, I think we probably can bring back options in the budgeting process that would provide it all fee-based, and that would also provide it uh, both general fund and fee-based. I think we can do that. If you want to get down to one option, I think we can do that. Madam Mayor, what we yes. um, what we really need is is an understanding of your direction with respect to level of service. Yes. Yeah, and so well, and then that. we can bring back a yeah. couple of different options. Yeah. I get that, but if if it's coming down to no, we would like it's it's just going to be property tax that does affect yep. what I pick on yep. level of service. So and and what you're hearing us say is we can bring you back one that does affect property taxes and one that doesn't. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Yeah, that is helpful. Yeah, and what. You're hearing it. I, I like that, too. But let me tell you, from everything that I receive from our residents, I want level of service at one and two days. Yeah, and that I think you, if we do go to just a fee, then, yeah. and it's very transparent and everyone can see it, then yeah. it is option one. Yeah. So should we bring back... Being the city and... Yeah, the city's doing it, and I and and Ryan, we do have some models, and thank you for bringing up the the street lighting model, mm -hmm. because let's take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. So we and, could bring, part of it, option one. We could bring back option one with different ways of funding it. Mm -hmm. With that, have some have uh, yeah. property taxes and some some that don't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That would be much. great. Okay. That's so what, that's what we'll focus on. Option one. That's the level of service. So let's all be clear. The level of service is one and two. We won't option. figure it any other way. Yeah. So. The, 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 what you will bring back to us so that everybody is clear is one with a fee base and one that will have a, a general fund contribution, right? But in all we're talking about is city force option one. Is that what I'm hearing? 
Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Guys. Thank you so Thank much. You. So we are all in agreement. We got okay. a March voters. Okay. Great. Thank you. So uh, the next item that we would have uh, considered tonight, but it's been delayed by the county until May 15th work yeah. session. Yeah, and that is the Dakota County that. Transportation Project cost share policy revision. So uh, that will be before us on the 15th. Uh, Dan, do you have anything on roundtable? Uh, nope. 35 solutions is Thursday morning. Broadband uh, GPA with the county is tomorrow afternoon. Uh, my first foundation meeting will be Thursday afternoon, and the AIM Center is going through round two of the RFP for operating. Okay. Kara? No. Okay. So Dan has uh, uh, 9-11 call center, uh, uh, 35W solutions all met right before our last work session. MBTA, the strategic plan, and fi was final and published document was approved. Uh, he noted that uh, we should have a PR for the media and promotion. Uh, this is a big way as there is a lot of great news and strategies and tactics uh, in the new plan. MBTA staff know that they will pursue all options. And we heard some of that tonight uh, from the presentation. And the partnership with DCTC uh, and MBTA uh, for added routes continue to for the college and the class sessions and a 50-50 cost split is what they have done. Uh, new items, uh, the FRH Service Opportunity Partnership. Dan G, casual discussion with exec director uh, on the bus service needs. Oh, for Fairview. Fairview. I was at the I was at the yeah. Promise, and I was talking to the HR people there, and and I just casually said, "So, what would a bus stop in front of Fairview do?" She goes, "Oh, God, we would just love it. Our employees would love it. The, their patients that would love to take a bus here." And I said, "Dan, you should talk to MBTA about maybe yeah. putting a bus out there." <laughs> well, a lot of it is you just heard. Uh -huh. You know, they don't have the equipment. Oh, I hear. I hear. Yeah. So it, all of that is money. So, and then he says a fun idea. event. <laughs> April 28th, MBTA driver rodeo, and uh, this is where the drivers go through an obstacle course. Yep. Uh, the, um, on my side, the uh, Burnsville um, Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, was in the monitoring report. The, the uh, minutes were in the monitoring report. I sent out the stuff, um, um, information from Greater MSP and International Festival is moving right ahead and we're on uh, target with our, uh, well, we're, we're doing all of our fundraising right now and everything's going well with the fundraising. So that's it and we are moving into our Metro Cities uh, meetings and that's going to start in June. June. Or May. Mm. Yeah. Mm. May, June. And uh, I've got a few yeah. meetings on that one already. Yeah, and uh, Savage Burnsville Joint uh, Meeting, that went well? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, mainly, you know, a lot of the discussion was over the road construction, so, yeah. and that was covered in the, yeah. in the briefing that we had, so. Yeah, okay, and that's it. Heather, do you have anything? No, ma'am. Michelle? We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.